Everybody ready? Ready? Are you ready? You. What? I just want to give this to Rick to Fusco. Okay. Mr. Fusco. For your budget, I don't know. Where is it? I don't know. I should have put that together. Okay. Now, how do I know when she's looking? Wave your hand. Oh, so I just wave my hand. She'll just put your hand. What is this for? Some of us already have. I don't know. He just gave them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good evening. The school board meeting of Tuesday, March 8, 1994, is now called to order. The first item on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda, and I have one. Um, we will be having an executive session after this meeting, so that would be item nine. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Okay. Seeing none, the next item is approval of school board minutes of the meeting of February 8th, 1994. Are there any corrections? Um, I I had one, I, I think, on page 23B under 8D personnel request. Is, isn't it Joey and Dowd? Yes. Anybody else? Okay, the minutes stand approved. The next item is comments by high school representatives. Do we have high school representatives tonight? Middle school representatives? Um, Nina couldn't make it tonight, so um, I'm going to be filling in for her. Um, to begin, the Student Council has been talking about um, various fundraisers, uh, the magazine drives and sweatshirts um, in maroon and gold with a capers motif on them. And next Tuesday morning's meeting, Mr. Roland Moore will be visiting the Student Council to give us some more details on that. Um, hopefully this year we can arrange to have um, nylon wind pants and jackets with our names embroidered on them also. Uh, the Student Council has also been discussing Spirit Week. We have a date set to possibly the first week in May or the last week in April, but we are sending two representatives to confirm that with Mrs. Hutton so we won't interfere with Tess or the um, sixth grade trip to a Chwonky. Um, the Student Council is playing the week's, uh, Spirit Week's day-to-day -day themes and the first of the week will begin with um, Hippie Day and followed by color day when each um, grade picks a solid color to dress up in and then beach day and sports day and rag day. Also last Friday we had a fifth and sixth grade social. The profits from that was roughly $296. We have also had um, our three new fifth grade representatives um, contribute their opinions on how their lunches, lunch period is too short um, but that's still open for discussion right now. Um, to conclude, we are hopefully going to be setting up the electronic message board again in the middle school office trophy case, and our vice president, Ashley Earnshaw, will be taking care of that matter. Did the students address how they feel about the food or just the length of time? I, it was just the length of time. Um, they, we have um, staggered lunches now, mm -hmm. so in our grade we go like 15 minutes after each, each other or five minutes, but they were noticing that they were getting you know, like hurried along and out, but because they also have recess now too. So I suppose that's one of the things that's keeping So the total going. lunch period's 25 minutes? Um, I 30? believe so. 30? 30. It's going to be 20. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. The next item is communications. Are there any communications? Well, I'd like to share uh, one I received from the middle school. Um, on Sunday evening, Neen Stanford was awarded the Richard Bartlett Award by the Adaptive Physical Education Association. The Bartlett Award is their highest honor and is given to an educator who has developed and delivered outstanding curriculum for students requiring adaptive programs. Neen has worked in this area for the last several years with her standard enthusiasm and professionalism. The middle school is certainly proud that she is one of us. We congratulate her on the award. It is well deserved. And I'm 
sure speaking for the board myself, congratulations. Dean Stanford teaches physical education uh, at the middle school. Anything else? Um, I did receive in the mail today um, a notice about um, the Main School Management Association's um, spring boardmanship workshop. Um, I don't think everybody gets these notices, do they? No. I think we get one in the office and I, and, and I got one. I did actually attend one of these a couple years ago as a new board member. It was, very, it was very helpful. It's just one, it's a Saturday, but it's just one day and they go over legal issues and you know, other uh, general issues that the board faces. So um, if anybody's interested in ten, attending, maybe Carla. <laughs> Um, and Beth isn't here, but I'll let her know about it. Um, it is a it is a useful workshop, and that would that's coming up March 26th. If you're interested, got the information. Okay, the the next item is the superintendent's report. Thank you. Uh, we're starting the evening with the high school foreign language department report because uh, you may recall. I think it may have been in November, refresh my memory, but I think it was November. We had an update on the status of foreign language and you asked them to come back um, and that is tonight. So they are here. You received in your packet a summary of information from them. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, you will have some questions or some comments and besides, I think uh, you're probably all expecting to give this orally, right? Good. Um, and Judy, are you going to begin? It's hard to believe I'm not as tall as the middle school representative who was just speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I can believe that. <laughs> I'm Judy Liberty from the Foreign Language Department. And as Connie just mentioned, in November, we were here and we were here to talk to you about our concern for a new teacher for one class of Spanish one. And I'm pleased to report to you that we have had Mr. Peter Davis in place as of January, and he just happens to be with us tonight, and he might just raise his hand so you could see his face, Peter. And he is now, as I say, uh, doing a fine job with our Spanish One class. Also at that November meeting, you had some questions and some concerns about the past and present and future foreign language programs and numbers, and you asked for more specific information about how we had arrived at the point of the overcrowded and unbalanced classes that we discussed that evening. And you invited us to return in a few months, and somehow that time has flown by, and here we are. Tonight, each of the four members of the High School Foreign Language Department will speak on one of the topics that you suggested. And I would like to begin by discussing the elementary school or FLESS program, and its impact and integration into the high school. Before the school year 88-89, about 25% of eighth graders began the study of a foreign language at that time, and no one below the eighth grade received any foreign language instruction at all. Beginning in 88-89, a new fourth through eight program began, by which each student received either French or Spanish instruction, depending on his grade, and continued with that same language for those years. This gave foreign language instruction to all students in grades four through eight. And it's really important for you to understand that this is not an introduction to foreign language, but it's foreign language instruction and experience. And we consider that this type of program is an accomplishment for many reasons, one of which is that it gives every student in our four through 12th grades, the opportunity for continual instruction in one language. And to articulate it carefully through grades four through 12 is vital. So that when the students under high school, the FLES or the entering foreign language students from the four through eight program are placed in one of three levels. And we feel that their placement should depend on their degree of proficiency rather than on the number of years that they've had instruction. So what we did was we wanted to assure the proper placement in high school and we devised a proficiency test which is based on the curriculum which we have developed. And by <coughs> doing this, every eighth grader 
has a proficiency test that is given to him. In fact, it was just recently done for the present eighth graders. It includes listening, speaking, reading, and writing components. And on January 27th of this year, every eighth grader had a 10-minute individual oral interview with a high school foreign language teacher or one of the four through eight teachers. And then on February 2nd, all eighth grade foreign language students were given the listening, reading, and writing components. We have, since that time, corrected the test, incorporated the recommendation of the present foreign language teacher at the middle school into that and have given the results to the guidance counselors. Therefore, the students, when they enter ninth grade, will be placed in, at level 21 or 22 or 31 of French this year and obviously Spanish if they're in the Spanish year the following year. So that they enter high school at the second or third levels of foreign language. In fact, our strongest level three students at the high school are freshmen who have been through the FLESS program. These students will take level four of the language as sophomores, level five advanced placement as juniors, and will enter a new level six, or whatever we decide to call it, as seniors. And this is the scenario with the present sophomores that are with us now. They're in level four, and they're the first group of students who came in with plus experience when they entered the high school. I can't really pass on to Barbara, who's the next person in line here, without mentioning what I feel the, the reason for whatever success this program has had. I think it's the faculty. I've taught in five different schools, high schools throughout New England, and I have some kind of an idea of what I think a quality foreign language department should look like. And at this time, this year, I think we are and you are extremely blessed with a team of teachers in foreign language in grades four through 12 who are not just very good, but who are determined to have an excellent foreign language program for the whole community. They're concerned not just with their classroom, but they're concerned with all foreign language classrooms in our system. The hours of work that they give outside of their regular duties are innumerable, and their dedication to teaching is really extraordinary. Their cooperation, in my mind, is unprecedented. And they're the reason for what's happening in foreign language in your town. And I'm proud to say that I'm a member of their team. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions if there's anything you'd like to ask on what I just spoke on, and Barbara Cannell is going to speak to you about numbers and projections. But as far as my presentation, if there's any questions that I could help you with before I sit down. You talked about the fifth year being an advanced placement mm -hmm. level. Would, is there such a thing as a two-year advanced placement level going into the sixth? Mm -hmm. uh, there is. What we have now is called French 5 slash advanced pr uh, placement French language, and we've done it this way because there is at the present time one class of that level. I have 21 students in my present French 5 AP, and we want to give them the opportunity to take French 5 without being required to take AP because that's the only place they can go because it's one class. However, that's going to change in the future as you will hear the numbers coming at you. Uh, for French 6, we have lots of choices that we can make. Um, there is a, an advanced placement literature, okay? So that would be possibility that we can consider. There would be then an advanced placement level in the language, and then another advanced placement possibility for them to choose, which is literature. Is that answering your yeah, question? Yeah, One other question. With the number of students that actually working with your current sophomore class because mm -hmm. they started language in, four, in fifth grade, mm -hmm. do, you, do you see a trend of students reaching maybe the fifth or sixth year of, of a language switching, so therefore of taking on another language? Switching to another language is something we thought would happen more often than it has at this point. We find that, to our delight, really, 
that not only are students staying with the language that they began because they've enjoyed their experience, and we, the numbers prove this out, there aren't a lot switching. Not only that, but we're now, this week at the high school, having tentative sign-up sleets where we as teachers have to recommend them and sign their sheet. And today I must have signed 15 of my advanced, or I should say level three students who like language enough that they also want to take Spanish next year. So uh, we have the crossover in that way. I think what we're finding is they're taking more than one language rather than switching. I, I'm really um, delighted with the fact that they understand that what they're getting here is unique in this system. What they're getting here is quality instruction in one language all the way through. And I think they're beginning to really see the value of that. Right now we have some transition. I may be jumping ahead of what may be presented in the next three presentations. Right now we have some transition classes like 2A. Mm -hmm. or do you see those going the way of, of, of leaving the system as we come in with stronger uh, classes, meaning this, the current freshman class having started fourth grade language? We really hope not. We believe very strongly that one of the nice things about our program is that it allows everyone to continue in a foreign language. And if we offer them some choices and if we encourage them to stick with the choices that we see through the proficiency test, that then this will give them the opportunity to have more instruction but at a level at which they are comfortable. And I think we have to serve all the students that we can. And if they want to continue a foreign language, I think that we should give them the opportunity to do it at the level at which they are comfortable. And we can say, well, you can't take any more foreign language at the high school unless you get to this proficiency. We could do that. We hope we don't have to, because we think that one of the beauties of our program is that we're allowing students to be able to continue the one language, and we're allowing them to reach a degree of proficiency, which obviously they wouldn't reach if they stopped or were not allowed to continue for whatever reason at the same language through the high school. So you, don't, if, you don't see an inclusion type of model? Not at this moment. Okay. There are not many groups of students in some of the levels. That is correct. Obviously, they're more in the middle. But that doesn't make any more teachers. That only makes the classes different. You, that's not making more staff. They're all, we're all going to be teaching them whatever mm. level they're at. Rosemary? Judy, I just had a question. The um, budget request is for a 0.4 increase, mm -hmm. and that is coincidentally the amount of value for FTEs on the uh, French 2A, 222. Is that correct? Is that uh, uh, why, or was it more widespread than just that one course? I'm not sure I understand your question. I'm not sure I said it very well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. DeFusco knows. I went to work early this morning. Um, the request in our budget was for a point four. Yes. And like I sometimes do, I tried to find out what that related to. And on the sheet, there was a um, what became 22. French 22, that's a new offering this year, is that? No, it's just a different number. We tried to make the offerings clearer by giving them different numbers. There was 2A then? Yes. That's, and it, that's all it is? It's the exact same course? Yes. OK. There are just going to be more students in that course next year than David? <laughs> no, more students in general. I, I knew that, but in that particular? There. Okay. I was just trying to. Yes. We, so when we get the French year, like this is the French year, eighth grade is French, then we get our numbers in each level are different. Okay. I'm sorry, that was sort of a sneak into the budget section question, but since you were here, okay. That's fine. And then uh, the other thing is uh, we know absolutely that all the colleges will accept that credit because it, it, is, it is different enough 
So it's not considered a repeat? That's we know that now after having done that for two years, right? Mm -hmm. That there's no problem? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons we've changed the numbers this year, I, just to make that I perfectly did figure that clear. Out. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I drew up the numbers that you see in front of you in terms of current foreign language enrollments and the projections on foreign language enrollments for the next few years. On the first page you see concretely what happened last year and what is happening this year in terms of foreign language enrollment broken down by the course and also by the, the year that the students are in, freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors. And if you look at that, you can visualize the impact that the incoming FLES students have had on the foreign language enrollments at the high school. If you'll notice the French enrollments in 1992-93, there were 70 ninth graders enrolled in French, a disproportionate number for um, a class that size. It's significantly more than 50% of the class because these students began their study of French in fifth grade. And this fits the pattern we're seeing of students continuing with the language that they began in the early elementary years. This year, you see the increase in enrollment in Spanish for the ninth grade, where we have 100 of the current ninth graders enrolled in Spanish 1, 2, 2A, and 3. So as Judy was referring to, the, the influx will come in waves. From one year to the next, it will be an increase in the French or the Spanish enrollment in those first years. What, we're seeing, what you see in this sheet as well is the, the decline in numbers that we see in the 11th and 12th grade, the juniors and seniors taking foreign languages, that this has been the pattern in the past. Um, last year, there were only 12 students enrolled seniors enrolled in French, 20 enrolled in Spanish. This year there are 27 seniors enrolled in French and 22 seniors enrolled in Spanish. Um, it's our hope and, I, and our belief that as the FLES students, the current ninth and 10th graders and the students yet to arrive from the middle school reach 11th and 12th grade, that we're going to see these numbers continuing to rise, that the students are planning to take four and five years of a foreign language. On the following page, you see the projections for, for the total high school enrollment. And again, the numbers above, above the line there are the actual enrollment for 1990 through 1993, 94, and then projected enrollment, which I got simply by subtracting the seniors from each year and adding the students in the current eighth grade or seventh grade or sixth grade. Past foreign language enrollment was about 74, 73 percent. Um, the projection for 1994-95, I've marked with an asterisk because it isn't quite so much a projection as, as simply taking a percentage and, and extrapolating it. That number was based on surveys that we did in our foreign language classes back in December, asking our students to, they didn't have to commit themselves formally, but how many were planning to go on in their current language, and again, how many were planning to either switch languages or pick up a second language as, as well. And 380 students plan to continue and or pick up. So that's a significant increase over past years where we're up to 82% of next year's high school students planning to take foreign languages. I was a little more conservative on the other figures and just figured we'll stay with 80% and see that whether they're Maybe their eyes are bigger than their stomach or their, their academic goals are greater than their subsequent initiative. Um, but you can see that the numbers show a significant increase from a low of foreign language enrollment in 1992 of 293, next year will be 380, and to a, a high of 1997-98 of possibly 456 students. And then the, the subsequent increase in staffing required to teach those foreign language students. Any questions? You had talked about the waves from the French um, primarily having the bigger group and then Spanish. Review for me how that begins. Okay. When students enter the fourth grade, they take either French or Spanish depending on which year. This year, fourth grade happens to be 
of French year. <laughs> this year, all the fourth graders are taking French. All the fifth graders take Spanish. All the sixth graders take French. In the spring of their sixth grade year, students have an option to elect what they would like to take for the two year seventh and eighth grade sequence. We are finding that most students continue with the language they began in fourth grade. Consequently, when students hit the ninth grade, they have had one language, four through eight, and most of them are continuing with that language. The incoming eighth grade is a group of, of French students. So next year, we will have a, a very high proportion of freshmen who are enrolled in French. The following year, it will be Spanish. Just out of curiosity, how did it come to be that one year is fourth grade is French and the other is Spanish? Is Primarily for administrative thing? reasons. Um, we believed, I was, I was on the committee that developed the FLES proposal back in 1986. Most of our foreign language staff was on the committee that helped develop the proposal. And we felt that we did not want to offer just one language because we would, in essence, be undermining the other language forever. We wanted to offer both, but that to offer the students a choice at fourth grade and have them scurrying in different directions for a 20-minute class was impractical. And that both, both languages had tremendous strength and validity, and therefore we should offer one. They have to take that language for four, five, and six. And then if they had strong, familiar reasons or whatever for, for switching, they would have an opportunity to for seventh and eighth grade. So it was purely to make it ease of administration and use, use the time well. All right, I'd like to introduce Paul. Oh. We currently um, are able to access students who want to take Russian and Chinese. Do you know the numbers that we currently have taking those two courses? There are about three of each. Three of each. Just, just for the record, those students travel after school to another school to take that course. It's not offered in our building or by our staff. I just, if people here, there are three kids in a class, they might want to know what we've done. Okay. Who, who absorbs the cost? <laughs> I'm not. I'm David Peary, by the way, for those who don't know me. Um, we contribute to a pool of all the communities that participate in that program. Um, I think it's a flat rate, I'm not sure, that we contribute as opposed to a per pupil cost. And I think it comes out, the last I knew, it was somewhere around $5,000 a year. We can check that out. We do provide transportation through our regular transportation system for that. It is a regional program students from other high schools. I don't know the exact cost at this point. We can easily mm. check that out. It's that covers, it's yeah. Co yeah, it covers from Scarborough, Portland, South Portland, Gray New Gloucester, um, Cumberland, Falmouth, did I say Yarmouth, Freeport. Um, the teachers have come from various school districts to teach those courses in the past. Some are from Portland. I know at one point there was a teacher from Gray New Gloucester offering one of the um, courses. The Chinese program is 5 to 7 in the evening. Do you have any idea when the Russian? Same time. Same time. And we provide the transportation. So that's a cost. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, I'm here to talk about um, a question you had earlier in the fall about students changing courses. And um, what was a problem for us is that it seemed as though students were appearing at our doorstep saying that they were moving from one course to another before we had any input on the decision. What would happen is a student would go to their guidance counselor and get a drop ad slip to initiate the drop ad procedure, at which point the guidance counselor would initial it to say that they had seen it and then send it on to the student to get um, the other signatures that, signatures that were required on that slip, which were their parents and the teacher. Unfortunately, they were coming to see us um, as the last person along the stop and what happened is conversations had already transpired and um, decisions had already been made uh, by the time we were consulted. Uh, we felt this was not always in the student's best interest, that perhaps they were um, getting out of a course that was appropriate for them but challenging and where they should be 
and they were moving themselves to another course, or perhaps um, they were getting, they were in a course that um, they would have to work for and that they were concerned about how much work they would have to put in and that we felt that this was an appropriate course for them to be in. And um, we thought that it would be beneficial to their experience to stay in that course. Um, after discussions with the uh, guidance department, we were able to work out a slight variation in that procedure in that now when a student wants to change levels, um, they will come see us first and talk about the difficulties they're having because after all, we are their teacher, we're the person who's working with them and we would like to be in the forefront of any decision making as opposed to um, their making a decision or having this discussion with their parents before we have an um, opportunity to talk with the students as to what the difficulties are and how they can be remedied before such a drastic action as dropping the course or changing the level is taken. So um, we hope that this procedure will be, um, will ensure a more stable number in our classes in the future as opposed to having fluctuations where you start with a class that's 24 and then students start moving and suddenly you have a class of 27 or 28. Um, it affects different classes in different ways. We tend to see students who are um, perhaps uh, shocked by the challenge of third or fourth level and in the first few weeks are having second thoughts about that course. Um, in the panic of the initial year, school year might be um, better treated with a little bit of patience and hard work and seeing that they are capable of doing that course as opposed to making a fast exit. Um, it may also help our, our lower, lower levels in that not seeing students fluctuating so much um, between the, um, what is now the, the 22 and the, the 21 course um, by letting them stick with that course for a while and see what's gonna happen. We feel, as uh, Mrs. Liberty said before, that we have a very strong staff. We are now providing the students, we think, with a very adequate preparation. Um, in the past, students felt they were ill-prepared. I don't think that with the current staff we're gonna um, have similar situations arise again in the future. So we hope that the number of students that we have registered for a course um, as of September will be the number that, that we will have towards the end of the year so that we don't have situations of classes becoming overloaded as we saw in the uh, Spanish one uh, this year. And we think in the end that this is a positive move and that um, our input into this whole decision making process is coming at an earlier stage, at a more formative stage, and I think that'll be of um, more benefit to the student. Carl? Um, it's uh, slightly different than switching levels, but do you find many students at the high school level, say even as late as 10th grade, switching languages and wanting to start all over? Um, there, there are some students, and we're perhaps seeing that this year for the first time, is that the students who came in from the FLES program last year and who've had two years of foreign language and have found that um, they're hitting a wall and that maybe it's time to, to uh, try something new. It's, it's good to see that um, I'm working with the 2A students. Of Most of them are, are going on with a new language if they're not continuing with French. So there is, there is that crossover and they're, they're taking the experience, they're taking the lessons they've learned and they're applying that to another Romance language of which there are a lot of similarities. They've, they've seen the most difficult lessons of learning a new language of, of how um, this, these Romance languages have verbs that have declensions performed upon them that English language does not have and that there's um, agreement taking place between nouns and adjectives that we do not have and those are for someone learning a new language, especially someone of that age, um, those can be very hard concepts to, to accept. And they've worked with that and they've understood that. And um, students who have had one Romance language, um, sufficient amount of one Romance language when they go into another one, um, tend to have a lot of success. I have um, three students in my French one who are also in Spanish three we're continuing and it's um, the, the French one is a, is a very easy course for them when they go on to the new 20, the old 2A, the 22 course next year I think they'll have something that's um, give them a bit more to get their teeth into. And I've had several students come up to me um, who are taking Spanish currently 
were interested in continuing with Spanish and also taking French next year. Uh, David, do more students drop one than another, or is that just totally dependent on dropping one course or another, like more on one level or another? Over from instead of taking French three, starting with Spanish one, say as a sophomore, or or does it really depend on what that mix is? In that every other year we heard Barbara describe. Um. I guess, I'm not. I'm not sure. Way. In in the in the past, I'll say in the past there were more students who seemed to be um, leaving their French experience after the second and third year and trying Spanish. And um, your expectation is that that. Would I think be it's it's we're probably going to see maybe an equal amount in both languages. <clears throat> uh, do you know offhand what the college requirement is for a foreign language, or should I address that to Sharon since she's at the high school? There's no requirement for a foreign language. For graduation. For graduation. College. Um, most colleges require, would like, and that changes from college to college, and the type of college one's applying for as to how competitive it is. Um, most, let's say, we'll generalize and say most colleges would like two years. As you start to get into a more, the more competitive the college, the more they want to see of one foreign language. Um, guidance encourages students to get a minimum of three years, actually, if, if they can. Those who are interested in the more competitive colleges, they encourage them to stay uh, four or five as much as they can. Because obviously, someone who is in French four or five as a senior has stuck with one language for a long time, has gotten into some very difficult concepts, has hopefully developed a fair amount of proficiency, and presents themselves as an academically serious student. Um, the um, fail-safe option is that if you've gone as far as you can in one foreign language, then to take up another foreign language because, again, that presents you as an academically serious student. Um, you have perhaps two years of French, you have two years of Spanish. As a senior, you're seen to be taking what are considered five traditional academic courses. Then, at this point, I'd like to introduce Mr. Skip Crosby, who will talk about um, some fun that's planned for later in April. David, can I just ask you one question first, just, just to clarify. What is now Spanish 2A and French 2A is now? 22. 22. Yes. Okay. Can, can I just ask you, um, one thing that we were talking about before was there, there were kids who needed that certain mm -hmm. level of a course before. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe I misunderstood, but it was my understanding at that time that that was seen as a temporary need, that level of course, that um, particular level. Or I'm, I'm not sure about that. I think that um, the two, maybe the two courses in question are 21 and 22. 22 is where um, most students place into from the um, FLESS program. The 21 course was created as um, a step that would help people who wanted to continue with their foreign language experience, but perhaps were not quite up to the, uh, the speed, pace, and rigor of the 22 course, uh, the depth um, of coverage that takes place in the 22 course. The 21 course is a, a second year program that spends more time reviewing first year concepts and introducing second year concepts. Having taught the 21 course last year, um, it was amazing to see what happened and how students bloomed who had an opportunity to work in an environment that wasn't as fast paced, who weren't working with all the fastest fish in the pond, and had an opportunity to work um, at a level that was appropriate to their needs. And um, there were quite a few students who bloomed. And I went back and talked with, at, at that time, Mary Ellen Tracy, who was the eighth grade teacher, and told her of my perceptions of these students. Early, early in the fall, and she would say, why, that student never participated in my class, and <clears throat> excuse me, as the French say, j'ai un chat dans la gorge, I have a cat in my throat. Um, French teachers don't have frogs in their throat, excuse me. Um, um, they, they didn't have to compete with students who went on to French 3 or, or French 2A, um, who perhaps didn't have the facility or the quickness of foreign language. So that was a very appropriate placing for them, just as we have math courses that covered different amounts of, um, of math in one year, and then they continue. So what happened was the, the two, the 21 course, is 
a transitional course in that it helps students go from French one at the high school or FLESS experience to um, 22, 2A, and hopefully further on. Some of those students are going on to French 3. Some of those students are finding that they've had a, a two-year high school experience, and maybe at this point um, it would be better to, to try another foreign language. I, I do want to commend you, too, on, um, on the, the way you evaluate kids that in the middle school also. Evaluate kids and, and place them. I think, I think it's an outstanding system um, that you use and, and uh, that lends integrity to the process. And I'm also glad to hear about the changes in you know, how kids decide whether to uh, change or, or drop courses. I think it's totally appropriate they come to you first rather than the other way around. We thought so. Yeah. Thank you. And now for Mr. Crosby. While Mr. Crosby comes up, it's so appropriate Mr. Crosby is talking about fun. <laughs> Skip Crosby, the most recent addition to the foreign language department, I say happily. Um, in September, we decided to start planning throughout the year for a foreign language week to celebrate National Foreign Language Week. And we appreciate the opportunity to share with you uh, some of the things that we're going to be doing. Um, as a result of that planning, we were each given a, a task to perform. And we each did our task, and as a result of that, these activities will, will take place during that week. Library displays will be at both the Thomas and the high school library, uh, highlighting authors and, and, and different cultural aspects of various countries and literature, etc. cetera. Um, the cafeteria will serve foods every day, representing um, various countries and, and, and ethnic foods, spaghetti, burritos, and quiche, for example. The cafeteria is very, very supportive and very willing to help us with that. Contests will go throughout the week during study halls and lunch. Trivia on geography and, and musical contests, guess that country, guess that song, where's the song from. We'll be having a career fair, which will introduce students to some options that foreign languages will facilitate in terms of, you know, of future career goals or, 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 and, and, and such like that. Foreign films will be shown during study halls from various different countries, not only the languages that we represent at the high school, throughout the week so that the entire film will be able to be shown. And we'll culminate the week with a dessert and coffee night at which parents will be invited and awards will be given to the contest winners. Also, as a part of this week, um, publicity played a role. I just wrote an article for the... Um, Parents Forum newsletter, an article will be written for the Cape Courier. This is part of the publicity and also it was presented to the faculty. We're real excited that the students will get an opportunity to um, express languages outside of the classroom. And we think it's a great opportunity and we hope that it heightens an interest and, and, and motivation as well. This you is just tell us the week. <laughs> yes. April, yeah. It's right here, April, <laughs> April 11th through the 15th. For the public. Thank you. Sounds fun. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. That's, that's very helpful and we appreciate you doing all that work to follow up on our questions. It is, um, it is one of the, I think uh, Judy started out by pointing out and I think that it's uh, Aptly so that this is an unusual program, and even though it is hard for you, I know from my own conversations with you, and um, it's difficult to predict exactly how this is going to grow. Your task of even dividing up the uh, of the students. I mean, down the road, predictably, this may be far more developmental than even you're thinking of right now. But at any rate, uh, it's a it's really a remarkable program, and we really do appreciate your efforts. Uh, we will continue to wrestle with the budgetary implications as success costs money. But uh, I think you've given us a lot of good information, and we'll move on. Thank you. Any more questions?
Oh, okay. Since the, there are many things uh, yet to cover tonight, uh, as with budget, all budget time, we're probably over ambitious. I'm just going to zip down through the other things. You have information in your packet on most of the items that I've got here, and I can do this rather quickly unless there's something you want to stop and discuss. Um, for those of you who are perhaps new to the board or uh, anybody who happens to be here, once a year we get a report card from the state. It's a summary of mostly financial statistics, but some other kinds of issues, academic issues, uh, that the state issues based both on our EMF 45 report at the end of the school year, which is a financial reporting we send to the state, and then also uh, there is a listing of the MEA scores. I would note that uh, for the 92-93 school year, which is what the uh, record card is over, both Pond Cove and the high school are what they call star schools. I hope the eighth middle school does not feel um, we should be quick to point out that that doesn't mean that the middle school is somehow falling behind. Um, the criteria is really uh, with the scores that we have kind of uh, splitting hairs and they're really all doing quite well. Uh, there are various statistics in here, as I said. I think the one thing I do want to call to your attention on, on financial statistics on the back page, and because this is something that's gotten some press uh, categories, the one that I have looked at and Scott and I have looked at, and we are frankly not sure where they're getting this figure from, school administration is considerably higher than we think it should be. Now, one of the issues we've already talked about in the um, budget uh, discussion so far is that uh, we are finding some anomalies in the way in which um, certain lines have been reported out and various staffing has been assigned to some of the lines in the uh, basic school budget. It doesn't add up to any different sums of money. It's still the same sum of money. It's just a matter as to which category you want to assign it. If you take every school administrator salary and add it up, it comes to less than 400000 so that where they're getting the 588, I haven't got a clue. Uh, but we will track that down and find it. The reason I point it out is that it's higher than the state average, which is something that the state is looking at, the um, ratio of administrative cost to teaching costs. I happen to think it's an error, and uh, hopefully we'll get a handle on that. You'll notice most of the others fall in line with, I guess, the exception of that service, which at the time this was reporting, was um, considerably below the state average. But we are <laughs> due to see a change in that. Unless there's a question, I'll, I'll move on. What, what comes under other instruction? We're still checking that one out, too. I mean, this is, this is t being taken from an EMF 45 reporting, uh, and We've had occasion to realize a number of times this year that some things are being ascribed to lines that, frankly, Scott and I are simply rebuilding them. I don't have the answer to that one. Okay? Okay. Moving on, I included minutes from our uh, system-wide reading committee, which met uh, last month. Um, some fascinating issues, especially when you look at things K-12. I'm not going to take the time tonight to go into that. It is an effort that's building on discussions we've had before. Uh, I just would like to point out, because in case somebody happens to be watching this, a fascinating piece that shows up right up through the system on this is that uh, children may be um, confusing the, uh, the joy of looking like you're doing something when they can't. Uh, one of the things, comments that uh, some teachers were making at different uh, levels is the uh, fairly strong and repeated habit of children carrying around choice books that exceed their level of reading ability. Um, you know, sort of like carrying around War and Peace in the fourth grade. Uh, I don't know that anybody's carrying around for War and Peace in the fourth grade, but uh, this is an issue that we really want to call the parents' attention. We don't want children to feel that they're successful if they're reading difficult books and unsuccessful if they're reading something that may be a little easier. Uh, and that's an issue we're going to be talking about a lot because uh, some things can go underground, some lack of uh, uh, practice can go underground, and that can create problems down the line. So I thought that was interesting, and it cropped up in, in a variety of ways. Okay. 
Dan, I, I put uh, some ongoing issues from our Quality Council Parent-Teacher Communication Survey. There's a very simple uh, survey that was put together by a group of our fifth grade teachers, and Nancy, uh, Nancy Hutton and Mary Bruns worked with them. Um, the communication survey has gone out. We're beginning to get some answers back. Um, it is intended to be uh, simple so that we can get some data back from that that will guide us in future choices. Uh, it's part of an ongoing effort to uh, ask people what they want and what they think and to improve the way in which we we uh, handle conferences. Um, on the 16th, which uh, is, help me out, what day of the week is that kind of? Wednesday. So Wednesday. Wednesday. Thank you. <coughs> Next Wednesday. Um, from 4.30 to 5.30, we're inviting anybody who is interested in running for the school board, and we have sent, or are in the process of sending out, um, invitations to anybody who's already taken out nominating papers. Uh, we hope that people will stop by, and you don't have to commit yourself to the full hour. We'll have tea and cookies or something, and um, be there to, uh, to try to answer questions and encourage your interest. Uh, even if you haven't, uh, not too sure, please stop by. We'd like to talk to you. And finally, beginning with Sunday, uh, you have in your packet a list of uh, times the visiting committee will be uh, at the high school. We'll be there on Sunday, those of you who can. Meeting again on Monday with the visiting committee, the NESAC accreditation, and I want to take this opportunity to thank Sharon Merrill, who was here, and Rick DeFusco, and all the high school teachers. I know you put a great deal of work into preparing for that visit. It's no joke. Also want to thank our maintenance custodial crew. I know that they're putting a lot of effort into that, too, um, and we're looking forward to meeting with the committee. So I think that's as fast as I could go through. I do have one question. At 4.30, they're to meet with the school committee. Where? Where, yes. That would be helpful. At the high school in the? It should say on the far right hand side of your schedule. It be there's nothing. No. It's on Sunday. There's no, other than saying the, cat, the social hours in the cafeteria, on Sunday there are no listing. Orientation meetings in the workroom. There's a tour. And then there's a meeting of the visiting committee with the school committee, and it doesn't say where. And um, I will be one coming from work, so I. Uh -huh. um, I'll just our program suggest the library. Okay. Um, can I just say you you're referring to a paper? I don't think I have. It's in your folder. It's in your folder. Uh, it's a new one we just got tonight. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other? Question. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay, the next item is school board subcommittees and reports, and the first is finance subcommittee, and I'll turn it over to Rosemary, the acting finance chair. Okay. Um, tonight we met immediately preceding this meeting and we uh, signed the warrants. We discussed some of the budgetary issues that had been raised uh, previously, although no, absolutely no decisions were made, uh, just for uh, further information. Um, we discussed the uh, transportation costs, the cafeteria costs, and uh, we reviewed uh, the athletic budget for the middle school and the high school and um, line items. Uh, no decisions were made in committee. Uh, it's just information gathering for the budget process. That's the end of my report. Okay. Any questions? Okay, moving on to school building committee. Honey, I think I'll turn oh. over to you in case there's been any updates since our last meeting. Basically, we've had a, a brief hiatus and a kind of a welcome one, I have to say. Um, from weekly meetings, but we're about to get cranked up again. The big piece now is a presentation to the uh, planning board on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, with a meeting coming on Monday. Uh, also, uh, we're continuing to get reports from the architects on various stages of development of design. And uh, tomorrow, as a matter of fact, um, uh, school people, architects, and their clerk of the works are working, walking through to uh, refine our um, phase-in plan so that we can be clearer about exactly what rooms will be used and so on. 
Charlie? Then we passed the zoning board. With yes. The provisional. Right. We, I was just going to say, why don't you, you? I don't know. That's why I'm asking. I only met yes, Paul for Liberty and IGA, so that's the extent of what I know about the zoning okay. board. Yes, we did, and there are some notations uh, on our, our plan, things to be, for instance, the, uh, uh, we had talked about moving, and obviously we're moving the buses to the current student parking lot. Uh, our, we will have some kind of structure on there. It's not exactly clear what it will be at this point. And there is on the plan a replacement of that parking lot um, on the side of what is now a, the, an occasional field hockey field. I'm not exactly sure what we call that field, but that's one of the, its current uses. Um, and then there, what, that, however, will be funded by uh, municipal funds. The town manager has been part of that discussion and has indicated ways in which that would be done. So it's not exactly part of the project, but it does have to go on the plan, both the zoning plan and the um, planning board. In addition, uh, from the zoning board point of view, we talked about parking, actually restricting the parking around the school area on Scott Dyer Road in particular. Um, and uh, there was some discussion, this is another one of those conditions about the sidewalk and kind of curbing and that type of thing, which will be worked through. But it's basically um, accepted. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Okay, the next item is unfinished business. Pond Cove placement procedures. And I do know there are some, some parents um, here who may want to speak on this issue tonight. I think after uh, Connie has had a chance to update us about what's going on and, and Beth Henderson, and the board has had some chance to discuss it, you will have an opportunity to speak if you'd like. So Connie, I think I'll turn it over to you. Okay, and then uh, I'll start by saying that this is, definitely not an item that anybody's going to be taking any votes on tonight or do anything more than open a discussion. We have uh, scheduled a meeting hosted by the Parents Association for March 29th, uh, the last Tuesday of the month. Uh, at that point, we will be firmer in some of the details that we're, as I speak, working on. Frankly, this is an issue that is a real iceberg issue. Um, as we've tried to understand and apply some of the concepts of quality initiatives. We use terms like iceberg issues and defining problems and looking for data to find solutions. Um, this year, this we had reviewed placement policy and procedure last year, but we left it with an uncomfortable feeling that particularly at Pond Cove, uh, and I don't think any of us felt we had nailed it. We had raised more questions than we had been able to resolve, and we kind of re-looked at our policy, but um, just simply didn't have a good sense of closure. Uh, in addition, we also were changing some of our uh, procedures for uh, conferences this year, particularly the spring conference, which typically had been held with a half workshop day and then a full day. And this year is scheduled for a, a full day, but not the half day. And we had some discussions with teachers about uh, how we would uh, rearrange that. And in those discussions, it became very clear, many teachers said that there were a lot of parents uh, during the spring conference who seemed to want to talk about placing their child for next year. In spite of the fact that the policy explicitly uh, states that there is uh, input for parents but not uh, the ability to actually choose a specific teacher, it seems to be one of those things that underneath the system there's a lot of unclarity about how do you get certain teachers or how do you express what you think is good for your child, and so on. Um, at any rate, we will be sending home a letter on spring conferences. Yes, there will be spring conferences this year. They will be scheduled primarily on April, I'm sorry, what's the date? April 8th. April 8th. However, as is always the case, they can be scheduled at other times. We will try to provide teacher um, coverage for classes if it needs to be during a time when class would normally be in session and teachers of course schedule them after school uh, or in some cases before school as well as that day. 
Uh, we, however, are suggesting to parents that in some cases we're not sure everybody wants to come in for a spring conference. So the letter will spell that out and there will be a form that people can send back and communicate to their homeroom teacher whether they want to or not because written information will be sent home to update all parents on how their child is doing at, as the year comes to a close. Uh, so I know that that's one rumor out there that there aren't going to be any spring conferences. Yes, there are spring conferences, but we're offering more flexibility and we're really quite curious to know if there are some parents who would prefer uh, to communicate through written means or on the phone rather than uh, actually scheduled coming in. So we'll appreciate your uh, giving us that feedback. However, we also know that um, uh, the placement procedures seem to be complicated by unsurety about what a balanced class is. Uh, how do you uh, how do you deal with all the variables that go into uh, deciding uh, just a gender mix to say nothing of academic mix to say nothing of social emotional mix? These are terms that are used and are in the current policy. Um, and then if somebody happens to have some idea about what particular teacher they want, how do we handle that? Uh, I did ask a friend of mine who was a statistician, how, if you take 140 students and divide them into six groups of roughly 24 students and look at the number of variables that we are trying to accommodate, what are the statistical possibilities? They're in the well over 10 billion. 10 billion not million. It is an impossibility to literally look at all the possible combinations, even of 140 students into six piles. So no wonder teachers get frustrated as they try to sort this out, and no wonder parents feel frustrated. Uh, we are sorting out the issues, and right now, and we do not really have, and this is not the appropriate form, to go into all the various things. But one of the things we're clear about right now, parents want to have some kind of say about how their child's day goes. And typically at the elementary, that seems to be, I wish I could kind of pick and pick a teacher, or the type of teacher, or be assured that the teacher understands my child. It's a very understandable, very powerful piece of information and whatever we finally come out with for uh, placement policy, there will be room for parent input. At the same time, teachers are convinced that there is something about grouping children that gives you either a workable group, a better workable group, a not so workable group. There are certain things that they know about little children that really does make a difference in how you put the kids together. Furthermore, for any kind of current philosophy of child development, we are not into tracking kindergartners, first graders, second graders. We do not have an AP first grade and a an high honors first grade and so on and so forth. We do want a mix of abilities. Our teachers are working to learn how to develop their skills in producing and understanding a core curriculum so that there are high expectations for everybody, but they're also working to learn how to give differentiated assignments so that while there's a core curriculum piece, there are clear differences among children as to how much they can handle in information, in the obvious cases of reading and writing with little children, same thing for math, um, but to be honest with you, this is a vision that American public schools have never totally learned how to do. And we will accept the responsibility of laying out for parents what we think we can do now and what are the steps that we will take so that we can do them better. These are some of the issues that we're looking at. As you can see, there's something here for parents. We want to hear the concerns that parents have so that we know your child. We're prepared to deal with some of those issues. You need, we would suggest that parents need to understand teachers' needs. And one of the issues that will actually produce a better curriculum, a more responsive setting for your child. And a third and very important issue that we're looking at is how do we truly improve that climate of respect? We keep talking about it. We have a little handbook this year. We're concerned about how the kids treat each other. We're concerned about any of the hidden signals we may be sending out about uh, dealing with children. And uh, those are the three strands that we're talking about. And um, frankly, the process is 
one where we're inviting in a um, group of parents to kind of test out some of our thinking on, give us feedback. Any, any parent who would like to join a conversation like that, we can find time to include you in some group. Uh, as I said, again, the 29th is an, uh, a meeting that we hope a lot of people will come to. Um, I would encourage you to um, give me a call if you want to or call one of the board members. Some of them are more involved perhaps in this than others. But, um, and talk to your child's teacher. And uh, the teachers concurrently are working with the administration to have a consistency of format so that we can be clear about what we're going to do and why we think that is important. Um, it's a difficult subject for us to tackle. And there are a lot of hidden issues, a lot of things that people sort of are not real clear about. They're kind of rumors, mythology. In some cases, it looks like if I just understood the hidden system, I could get it right. Um, it's time for us to stop and take a good look because if we can really understand how to produce a setting, classroom setting and school setting for young children that will um, uh, really put our money where our mouth is about individual differences, I think we can get somewhere. Okay? Comments from board members? Charlie? Just one observation. In the initial proposal for consideration, what's different in what what's already in the placement procedure from what's sorry. different what is different interestingly enough are the hidden issues what but you find when you dig into this is that there's a lot of stuff that isn't in the real proposal it isn't even in anything that you can find written down um, that um, I think that it's highlighted by saying that when teachers have, have tried hard to match each child to one of six teachers who will be the best match, um, to make sure that children, in some cases, they've even tried to put children together who are friends, or to separate children who, frankly, are not friends. Um, the variables are enormous. And what we really have to start with is by saying, it's probably, uh, we're promising a lot more than we can actually do. Um, there are other kinds of issues that, um, that I'm not even sure of right now that I'm kind of becoming aware of. But I think that what is different is that nobody really thinks that procedure works. The teachers feel that it doesn't work the way it's supposed to, and I don't think parents think it works the way it's supposed to. And so what this process is trying to clarify, well, what is really happening? And what do we understand that? I just I see this as more of a boilerplate, broad. You know, it asks for parent input. These are the areas that that, that they're that the staff is looking at in placement, and the hidden. I don't see how you're going to get the hidden agendas into. I think they're just too numerous to. Well, one of the ways in which we're we're contemplating doing that is asking parents to give us that insight into their children. We had uh, we used a form last year. Some parents did a beautiful job. Some parents either felt, you know, they were too busy or didn't want, choose to do that way. We have to think of various ways in which we can get input, but that that input would go to the receiving teacher rather than to the placing teacher. The groups would be put together by the staff with the final decision made by the administration, and that the receiving teacher receives that input about the students. And as one teacher said when we were talking about this, I'd have all summer to study these children and to plan what I need to do to meet their needs. Another issue that has been driving this, when you, we loosely talk about matching a child to a learning style to a teacher's teaching style, if you really probe that, you're saying that teachers cannot teach children well who do not have the same kind of learning style that they have. Frankly, um, I don't think that's a possible, certainly is statistically impossible with six teachers. Uh, we cannot, uh, I think, as professionals, really stand up and say, well, I can only teach one kind of child. I've got to be able to teach all kinds of children. And I think it's a responsibility of the school and the staff development and the, and the teachers as a group to maximize our individual strength, but to learn how to do some of the things that don't come natural. I think that's the atmosphere that will produce the, um, the most uh, the best results in the long run. I see it twofold. I see changing the parent's perception of what a teacher is. 
mm. from what they know a teacher is from their own experience. Mm. And that, that's changing and evolving. And also changing the teachers, thinking that, they're, that they, they don't necessarily have to be a one-on-one -on -one type teacher, that they can be a manager and utilize other resources to. I think that's very true. Um, I also think that one, another thing that is, is cropped up in my conversations, um, both with teachers and parents, but this is particularly true of parents, I think parents tend to remember their latest educational experience the strongest. That is the college years or the postgraduate years. And of course, we all went to the library and looked up the black book and found out exactly what somebody said about teacher X, Y, and Z. Uh, of course, that's, that's appropriate at that level because there is a certain uh, correlation between the individual strengths of teachers and the kind of course they can teach. If you really think about it, is that an appropriate way to deal with individual teachers for an elementary school? There are individual differences among teachers just as there are individual differences among children. But if we're really going to create a learning community for a school, then the teachers truly have to become a group that works together and become much more diagnosticians of children's learning and recognize the clues that five and six-year-olds six -year give us, as you said, managers of their learning. Um, they're not mature enough to pick out the teacher that has the, the, you know, the, 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 in the same way one does in college or the postgraduate level. Um, I may be, that's just a thought that's occurred to me as I've talked to parents and heard over and over again the concern about the quality of the individual teacher as if that assures a certain program. And I think if we're going to meet the board level policy of expecting high standards of everybody, of teaching children from kindergarten on up how to set high standards and move at towards them in a certain way and so on and so forth. I think we need to create very carefully a structure that talks about teamwork and um, mutual respect and that's, that's going to work for teachers as well as it's going to work for the kids. However, I'm not naive. <laughs> I have a feeling this is a paradigm shift to use a buzzword. Uh, and I think it's kind of exciting, and I hope that we can get some real good conversation among parents about this, but I can appreciate the fact there's going to be a lot of, of uh, nervousness about this. Carla? Um, a question and a comment. The question, um, what you just said a little earlier, Connie, um, about the receiving teacher mm -hmm. getting, I mean, after a receiving teacher has a new class placed, then the end of the school year at the spring, they get all the parental forms? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds like a good idea. Um, the comment, I don't think it's anything that um, hasn't been said before, but I would just like to say that I really hope that we can figure out more than just a general kind of thing as has been going on in the past and really somehow come to some solutions because it's evolved into a situation where there's an incredible amount of parental panic, I think. Mm. And a lot of the new parents in the system, incoming kindergarten parents or people who just moved here, very quickly somehow pick this up through the parental grapevine and there's an intense amount of peer pressure on the parental level to somehow figure out how you do this lobbying for teachers business and it would be great if we could get back to the ideal of the characteristics of the child and the characteristics of the teacher rather than people trying to manipulate it for specific teachers. Well, I, I appreciate the comment. I think that this is, um, this is an important um, task for us. And I just want to say that I have also talked with teachers in small groups and with the entire faculty, and I have found them very energized to solve this problem. I'm sure that, again, I'm not naive. There are lots of, of reasons why people might find that change difficult. I mean, what they have, every, every one of us has in our heads is a change. It may not be what we collectively put together. But I think it, it seems to be a problem that's identifying itself loud and clear, something that we ought to solve. I'm just, just, just a minute. Um, I think we, we do need to very explicitly acknowledge that we will be asking um, parents and teachers to a certain extent to take a leap of faith that we can actually make this work. 
And the only way I can and that I can see that that's going to happen is if we are very explicit in our procedures for how we're going to um, create classrooms of kids, um, be much more directive in the kind of parental input we get, not just the general questions. Um, just to make the procedures very clear, I, we have to sit, sit down, and I know we've got a meeting <coughs> scheduled soon, but and ask, well, what about this kind of situation? What about that kind of situation? What about the situation where a uh, family has had that teacher once and it, it, it didn't work out for some reason? What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about the parent who, for some reason, can't communicate with their present grade teacher? How is, how is that family going to have faith in the system and the placement system for next year? We've got, I, I think this is the time to get very uh, nutsy boltsy about how we handle all these situations and make it as clear, communicate it as clearly as we can to parents all the way along. Um, you know, I think parents have a very real fear, um, you know, and here we have parents here for the first time in months, really. It's because parents are afraid to be, of being shut out of these mm -hmm. um, decisions that, that they think are very, very important. I, I believe in the direction we're going. I think, it's, I think it's right, and I think we have a major opportunity here, but I think we have to really turn over every single rock that we can possibly think of if it's going to really work. So. I agree. Any other comments from board members? Roberta? Uh, Sorry, the question I had was, do you anticipate having teacher representation at our meeting on the 29th? Oh, yes, I do. Um, I know that Beth is working with team leaders as well as, of course, the teams to have very explicit. Um, do you want to talk to that at all? Well, we think that's really important. I think Anne is, is really right on in, in uh, how we need to define this procedure and process. I think it does need to be very nutsy, boltsy, and very clear as to what's going to happen when, because we do have a limited amount of time in which to do it. Um, one of the things that we did yesterday morning with all the team leaders and actually two representatives from each grade level was to sit down together as a team, K through four, and look at the way that we saw that the, the uh, how the information that is going to be presented at the spring conferences should be presented, and to make that consistent kindergarten through fourth grade. Um, I put uh, in your packets a collection of those, and I think you'll see that consistency is there, that similarity is there, um, the specificity that we've been looking for as far as um, uh, the curriculum, again, K through four, I think that's been something that we've worked very hard to, to accomplish and to uh, articulate both for us, for us as a school and for grade level teams and certainly for the parents. And that's, um, that I think is a, is a real step forward for us. I think the teachers feel good about what's been accomplished. Um, I think it's it's real important in this whole process too to keep in mind that this, all of this are, and all of these steps really are works in progress. That uh, as we as we go along, I think we're going to see areas that can be refined. This, I mean, this happened just within the various grades as they we worked on this process yesterday. We used um, as a model the work that the kindergarten had done for their January report card. Uh, it was work in which they, they had spent a great deal of time refining it, and it acted as a, as a really good jumping off point for the rest of the grade level teams. Um, it's very, I think, very comprehensive. Uh, we've tried to reduce it to um, uh, just those essentials um, and not to make it exactly a report card. It does raise the question, I think, what should we do about the report card come June? But I think this is, this is one step, and it's a very important step uh, as far as clarifying this whole process. Um, I think that also another aspect of this that I think will be very helpful is to use, is to uh, address the issue that, that Carla was talking about, the parent input. I think teachers very much agree that it will be a lot more productive to use that information, that input that parents um, give to teachers in a productive way for the following year and to to uh, do the planning, do your class planning around those kids that you're, that you're going to have and the information that you have about them. 
So those two items, I think we need to be very clear um, how, those, how that information is going to be, going to be used. And also, I think we're, we're really pretty clear um, as to those, um, those variables that will go into making a balanced classroom. I think teachers, we, we spent a lot of time in talking about that. How does one create, what are the things that go into creating a balanced classroom? Things like gender, things like um, uh, in the academic areas, reading ability, math ability, those kinds of things. And cre I, I think that uh, there's a lot greater chance of success if those, if those things are, are balanced. I'd just like to follow up on Connie's um, comment about the 10 billion um, opportunities uh, within 160 students moving. Let's assume that all 160 choices are not correct. Um, one of the other things that I would like to see spelled out is what is the appeals procedure? Um, what do parents have to prove? Uh, what do they have to say and to whom and, and how? And I don't mean which words, I mean in writing or mm -hmm by phone or just exactly how it's done because with that many variations there has to be at least one oh, I'm that sorry. isn't right and I think that those steps could also mm -hmm. be um, spelled out and yeah. that will help people relax a little if they do know there is a window right and again I think that, that the clarity of that both for staff as well as as for parents I think it's it's very important to have those guides and, you know, Beth, I do feel I have to say, um, sometimes when parents require, um, request, or whatever word we use, uh, remove, to remove, or change what a student does, very often people take it personally, and that it's a reflection on either their ability to communicate or their ability to teach or how they look or right. whatever. I, very often, um, there are things you cannot pinpoint. And sometimes it's very clear that it's just, well, this person's learning style and this person's teaching style, or even sometimes it's just personality or the tone of the voice that the uh, teacher uses. And I, I just hope that people keep that in mind mm -hmm. when decisions are made. I mean, if you're a school board member, it might be something like, uh, this is a teacher that you negotiate with and it would be inappropriate for your student or, or could be inappropriate. And I just think that if we can um, sensitive, be as sensitive as possible about some of the non-specific, non-educational reasons why a change may be appropriate. And I understand that the decision has to be made on educationally sound right. bases. I, I understand that. but from a non-professional teaching parent's position, um, if we could be a little more lenient about what we listen to as a reason and at least listen to it and take it into account to the extent that we can. I mean, I think that that will make people relax an awful lot because the word panic was used. I don't think that's an overstatement. And it would be nice this year if the parents of Little League students could, uh, Little League players could get to watch the games because quite frankly, there are people in the stands trying to watch the games who can't hear what's going on or see because of the jockeying for, how, do you, how did you get that teacher four years ago and how do you think we you know, can get that teacher next year? And you know, it, it's really a shame um, that so much energy is put in um, outside of the process to right. try to make something work when if all the parents who are going to have those discussions on opening day and for the next you know, 15 games to please be at that meeting for the PCPA and be part of the process uh, before the fact instead of post facto. Right. I think, I think you really captured an aspect of it. I think there's a lot of energy that goes into this, both on the part of the parents as well as the staff in, in attempting to past tense attempting to manage this and I think that that all of that energy can be used in a lot more productive ways both for our, for our staff members and and for parents as well uh, I survived Pond Cove placement you know could be a t-shirt sale or you know <laughs> <laughs> fundraiser 
Um, okay. Beth, at, we're having a meeting when on the 15th with yes. the administ I think it's administrators. And are, are we going to discuss these um, forms? Sure. I think get, that I, I um, wanted to get them into your hands so you see what we've what's in okay. place at this point. And okay. Have a chance to look okay, at them. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I know that's been, this has been a lot of work in a very concentrated period of time. And on that note, I would I would just want to stress that, as you said, these are works in progress, and we're trying to fix a problem that's been around for a very long time. And we may not get it exactly right right away, but um, with with everybody working on it constructively, I'm sure. Well, I think Connie uh, mentioned that the staff is very enthused about it, and I think they are. I think they're very invested in, in the success that they see that this might have. Well, parents who I've talked to um, individually about the direction we're moving in and some of the things we've been discussing have been generally pretty positive about it. And I mm -hmm. do think that what will make this work is being as explicit as we possibly can and really listening, because there may be some things we're not thinking of right now I'm sure. um, that, that people will bring up. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Did, did any, anybody else want to speak on this? Any other parents? Judy? I'm Judy Lardner. I'd just like to say I don't have a definite opinion on how you do this. Obviously, I don't have the background, and I trust you to do that, but whatever the procedures are, besides being explicit, that you definitely stand by it. Because two years when my child entered the system, it was very clear that there was a hidden procedure for doing this and that some parents knew how, and it is one hell of a way to enter the system to know that you don't know it, and you feel really crummy about the whole system. So whatever it is, make sure that Granted that there should be um, appeals for specific things, but if more squeaky wheels get in, I, I got the introduction I got to this is before the placements were made. I heard parents discussing at swimming lessons the teachers that their children got and then went to a kindergarten transition team meeting and was told explicitly no one could know that the placements were not finalized, but lo and behold, those parents did get those teachers. It's very discouraging. So good luck. Point well taken. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's not a unique experience. We we moved into this district and it was a head turning experience. It was it, it was a very bizarre experience and that's the exact type of thing we're trying to change so that it's up front, everybody understands what's happening and the, the reasons why things are happening. Certainly not everybody's gonna be happy at the end, um, at perhaps at the end of placement. Hopefully everybody will be happy once they're into their year. Um, and we can we can achieve a satisfied and functional system uh, that will address parents' and students' needs. But it, it was a very bizarre system. Yeah, plus, I just want to say, um, Rosemary was saying opening day of Little League. Well, this year was a new low as far as I was concerned. I got a call before February vacation from someone <laughs> asking about And I thought, boy, you know, we, we're not doing this a minute too soon. You know, so, Rosemary. Different. Actually, it was Carl. Um, what Judy said kind of triggered my memory also that um, I think we want to be careful with publicizing placement dates. Um, kindergarten this past year with the huge incoming class. In the past, it had always been when incoming kindergarten parents got their little letters at the end of the summer that said, your kid is morning or afternoon and here's their bus. That's when the teacher placement. And for some reason this year, parents were led to believe they were going to find out in when other students did in June. And then all summer long it kept changing, two weeks, and then it was July. And there were a lot of incoming kindergarten parents that pretty much spent the entire summer in a state of hysteria. And I, I think it would be better to either just not say when kindergarten people are going to know their, or just go back to it's in the letter at the end of August. Wasn't that because we didn't know how many sections there were going to be until the final? I think that's what that, I mean that that really wasn't always the role. I mean that was we were holding out for if we made the right decision. <laughs> but before that this past year it had always or for a while had been in the letter that came in August. Middle school kids have that same problem. They have to wait until they some one of their friends rides through the parking lot to see if the sheet's up, and then they all go home and say, "Yeah, you can go find out. I know who I got." So, there, and I think that's probably only eighth grade, but you know, there there are is the word anomalies. Yes. <laughs> yes. We'll work on them. Very good. Anything else? Any, anybody else? No. Roberta. We've got that issue in 
Will there be any set policy as to when you will decide to advise? When, who who the teacher will be? Are you going to make a school-wide decision? At the end of the year, you go, because you do, some children know with certain grades who the teacher will be the following year when they leave school. Uh, we will certainly be on our list of things to clarify. I mean, frankly, um, what I have discovered, I've discovered more in the last six months about this issue than I, than I knew, you know, the previous two years. I, I think that the overwhelming thing is that I don't know how they would know. I mean, according to this policy, they shouldn't have, but there must have been some pipeline somewhere that was giving that information. That's part of our problem, perhaps, but we will try to be that will be under discussion and decision will be made. We will try very hard to make this, as everybody is saying, clear, consistent, open. I mean, that, that's the, those, those are the, the pieces that uh, I think have been getting us in trouble on this whole thing. Yeah, to be honest, we have to be careful that staff understand that, you know, the procedure and, and the appropriate channels so that things will come out, because I know there have been times when staff members have maybe been so excited they couldn't help but tell people <laughs> certain things but that just raises the anxiety <laughs> level of everyone else and um, creates a bit of cynicism so do you want to come up i just like to make a comment about trying to incorporate some type of feedback because i was one of those parents that took the time to fill out last year what I thought would, not a teacher, a specific teacher, but um, a, a certain style or environment I thought my child would do well in. And that has not been met. And I'd like to see that I will write the same thing again this year, and I'd like to see it met. And it would be nice to be able to get, to have a standardized or a, a way to, to give feedback that, that um, it wasn't met, and how do you go about saying that without offending the particular teacher style, um, without causing a lot of harm? I think and that's a central issue, and feedback is something that schools are not good at. Um, again, some of the uh, analysis that we have picked up from trying to look at, for instance, quality methods. So you're, the word feedback is almost um, unknown to schools. So we give we give feedback to students and to parents to report cards, the idea of getting feedback back, if you think about it, has been a problem for schools. And so we are treading on, on new ground. And I, I, I have to tell you, I think staff is, is really interested in it. But it is also um, kind of a, a, a new area and, and an emotional one. Hmm. I, think, uh, I think one of the problems with, with perhaps the way we worded things is encouraging parents to talk about the kind of atmosphere you are hoping for may not be the best way to phrase that question. It may be that we need to know your insights into the child and that the, the, the real focus of the new shift and paradigm and reform education and so on is to stop really focusing on teaching styles and programs, but on children and on the curriculum as it relates to children and what they're actually learning and really putting so much energy on that that some of the other things will fall into place. Now, that's not to say we're not interested in the atmosphere you want, but it may be that with six teachers and billions of possibilities, if we encourage you to imagine an atmosphere, we may have opened the wrong expectation. Right. So we need your help in, in feedback from your sense of disappointment that you did give something in and somehow it didn't quite turn out that way. We really need to know that. But we also need to know how does that translate into specific assignments or specific issues that you see your child in a learning situation, uh, and it could be cognitive and it could be social emotional, and we need to really wrestle with this to get that kind of thing. I also think that through many, many discussions through that pipeline, that a lot of times it's other, that, that the real core or the real problem is, is not perhaps the placement. It's that you think a particular teacher will give you a better curriculum. Yeah. So I think a lot of it is more, it, it's, it's, it's deeper than that. You want to get um, a strong math 
mm-hmm. person or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Whereas if, if the curriculum, personally, you know, is the curriculum's great, I don't care about the teacher. I mean, mm. I'm not going to school. I mean, and as long as my child's happy and is learning, it, it makes absolutely no difference to me. If I can be assured that I have, there's a strong curriculum and my child is learning and happy, it has absolutely, it's one less thing I have to think about and I don't want to think about it. So I think that there are a lot of underlying problems and people have taken it upon themselves, especially maybe some of the more assertive parents that say, okay, I'm going to get around this weakness here and I'm going to, I know this, the curriculum may be weak, but this teacher is strong, I want that teacher. And I, I, I don't that's think right. that's healthy. I mean, you'd like to think that whatever teacher you got is going to be great. Well, that, we get, couldn't agree more. And I think that really, I mean, from yes. all of the discussions I've had, it, it's, it's more that. They're really worried about getting that right curriculum, and, and they sort of feel, for whatever reason, you know, they've had other kids or through the mm. grapevine. They've, they've ear, they, they earmarked teachers. Well, this, the system has been marked by um, uh, more individuality, uh, a value of individuality or individual quality rather than a kind of um, a systemic or, you know, systemic curriculum and so on. And the efforts in Pine Cove in the last couple of years to actually clarify curriculum across so that, you know, third grade is something you can expect to get. Uh, at least the same core curriculum with variations. And that is, I agree, is very important. Anyway, thank you. Okay. And that work is ongoing, by the way. And uh, just because uh, Connie is taking notes, the speaker's name was Ellen Granulati. Just one comment on the beginning of, of what you described. And that is, I think th- that when you've taken the time to produce some type of input to the placement process. Uh, if, if a parent feels that for some reason the match is not, not what they were thinking of, I, I think that we need to have the system, and it is described here, although perhaps not accessed as easily as it might be, where the, dis- the discussion of placement can, be, can take place concerning an individual student so that perhaps the parent can become enlightened as to how, what it was that, that my input was able to direct to this given placement. How did you come up with that? Because that's, I think, oftentimes a mystifying experience for the parent, is, is they understand their communication to be of a certain nature, and then at the time of placement, it seems like it missed the boat entirely. And so I think that opening the road to the administrator, that, that's going to be a lot of work for the administrator. I'm not sure how best to answer that problem, but I, I think there has to be a coherent answer to that patient, or the, excuse me, that parent's, <laughs> that parent's input as to how it is. You know, yeah, we thought, we read that, we understood it to be this, and this is how we got to this teacher. And we, we think this is the best placement for these reasons. And I think in the past that has not necessarily happened. Yeah. Just, just very quickly, I, I think that Connie had mentioned earlier that it's, it's very important for us to, to look at that parent input form once again and to make sure that we're asking the right questions. Um, and I, because I think what we're going to be hoping to do with that information is something entirely different than we did in the past because we found that that information, taking that information and trying to use it was an impossibility. We'd like to make it very useful. Well, anything else? Okay. Uh, This is, I just want to say personally, uh, it's one of the more difficult things I've tackled, but it's also one of the more energizing things. And I think that if we can get it right, and that means that we start and get better at it, not that we get it right the first time necessarily in all aspects. Um, I think that uh, the school will, will benefit. I certainly think the relationship between parents mm. and teachers and the school system in general will benefit greatly. Maybe we can channel all that energy in. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Real positive way. Anything else? OK, the next item is new business, personnel request, retirement. And we have, um, actually, you have a letter of resignation in your packet from Barbara Cummings. You do not need 
to uh, vote on that, but I, I wanted to make you aware of it. Uh, Barbara is still working, um, loosely speaking at least, for the system because she's now working in community services, which is, uh, of course, affiliated with the school department. But she has um, resigned from her position at the high school guidance department. The other, um, actually, this is a retirement. You have a letter in your packet from Joe Conroy. And I put it in so that you could read it and comment. If you um, uh, were unaware, Joe Conroy has spent 32 years teaching in Cape Elizabeth um, and has left many, many students uh, leaving his classroom feeling not only that they have learned something, but they have made a kind of a professional friend. Uh, I know from many former students or young people that I've known over the years how, um, how much affection they have for Mr. Conroy. Um, and when he starts out somewhat like every man, uh, you get a flavor of his sense of classical literature. Uh, I have to say that he's, if you remember Chaucer's Clark, <laughs> gladly do I teach. I often think of that with Mr. Conroy. Anyway, he is leaving us, and this is his letter. And um, thank you, Joe, for what you've done. And we look forward to seeing you in many ways as you go into your retirement. Probably not really retire. He's talking about yeah. doing other things or even continuing teaching in other capacities. Oh, no, my husband is one of those oh. former students who thinks very highly of them. I was delighted when he saw him again after a number of years at the uh, Christmas tree sale oh. at yeah, oh yeah. You must see a lot of former students there. Yes. Do I hear a motion? Rosemary? Madam Chair, I move we accept the uh, retirement of Joseph P. Conroy. I second that. Second. Any discussion? Um, Rosemary? 3,000 students this man has impacted. Very darn close to 3,000. Since we're dealing with Billions, I just thought I'd add that. <laughs> 3,000 students. Charlie? We've been talking about a lot in the last two to three years since Connie's been here about respect and children respecting and learning respect. And I think this is one of those teachers who students respect, but teacher also respects the students. And I think that love shows through. I've never heard him say anything derogatory about any student. He always tries to find something positive. That's very true. All in favor? Five zero. <clears throat> okay, the next item is nominations for coaching positions. For Madam Chair. Three, 94 Spring Sports. Yes, Rosemary. Before discussion of this item, uh, in light of the fact that there are only five members of the school board present and four make a quorum, um, I would like to respectfully ask to um, step down from this vote for personal reasons. Okay. okay, I'll read the list. These are coaching positions for the 93-94 spring sports. Varsity Baseball, Scott Shea, JV Baseball, Kevin Adams, Varsity Softball, Janet Hoskin, Varsity Lacrosse, Charlie Birch, Assistant Lacrosse, John Bye, Raider. Bay Raiders. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, JV Lacrosse, Ben Raymond, Boys Track, Scott Hendry, Assistant Boys Track, Part Time, Bill Rice, Girls Track, Ray Cooper, Boys Tennis, Andy Strout, Girls Tennis, Elizabeth Cusack, Assistant Girls Tennis, Susan Ray, Eighth Grade Softball, Anine Stanford, Seventh and Eighth Grade Tennis, Rachel Garrett, Seventh and Eighth Grade Boys Track, Paul Casey. 7th and 8th grade girls track, Therese Lemansky. Just a point of clarification. I noticed that we have an assistant girls tennis coach. Do we also have a position of an assistant boys tennis coach? Are we servicing the same number of students for each sport?
I, I have a hard time um, approving, you know, if, if the teams are the same size, I have a hard time approving an assistant to one team and the other team does not. It's just something I just picked up now. Carla? I just want to be a little bit of a test and point out to um, Charlie that there's a boys track coach and an assistant boys track coach listed here and there's girls track and there's not an assistant girls track coach. So just to uh, point that out. I think there's an overlapping responsibilities with both boys and girls in track and in, in tennis as well. There are still some openings that haven't been filled. I don't have that True. opening yeah. list. But I know. Yeah. I do know that it's the usually list. usually the assistant boys track coaches usually um, um, field events versus track events. Any usually services, but I know they. But I think we need to clarify it. Charlie, Bill right. Press does do the field events for both teams. I think we just put it under one category. In other words, he will work with the field event people, both the girls and boys team. That's Bill Rice. Does that does that work for tennis? No. Well, we can certainly check that, but I I think it would be. It would be safe to go ahead with this. We can check this out and give you any answer on that. Okay. Do I hear a motion? One clarification. Sure. I think when when the uh, co-curricular and athletic committee meet, I think they need to address the um, how these positions. Are set up. Mm -hmm. I really do. Okay. I will approve it for this year, but I think for the next mm -hmm. year they need to clarify okay. some of these positions. And what the threshold. And if are. there was a reason last year that may not, mm -hmm. you know, stand up for this year or the needs for this year. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Do I hear a motion? I move to accept the superintendent's nominations for coaching positions for the 93-94 spring sports as read. Second. Mark, any discussion? All in favor? Or zero? Thank you. Hey, Rosemary, come on home. Okay, the next item is budget discussion. And are we just going to yep. take each of these separately? Community services is on first, Charlie. Could we take a five minute break? Yes, Please. I think that would be. Fine. We're, we'll, so we're going to take a five-minute break before we start. And is Sue going to sit up? Oh well. <laughs> Sue, do you want to sit up? I want to sit up here. I just need to clean. <laughs> Every senator in the morning when he shaves. Sees himself with the great seal of the United States. Received 33,000, and um, we're hoping for at least that another year. The um, projected program growth, as well as some of the director's time, has been reassigned to the central office. And because of this, we were able to um, remain constant with our bottom line. Due to interest and demand, our goal was to improve and provide more opportunities for teens by expanding <coughs> some of our summer programs, including um, repeating our Western adventure. In fact, um, if you refer to your green sheet, um, I have highlighted, or actually I think it's the blue sheet, I have highlighted some of the changes in the Western Adventure. Um, not only will we be doing horseback riding in the Grand Tetons, um, but we'll also be going to Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon. So that trip has um, been expanded um, over last year's trip. And our newest endeavor, um, is a European trip planned for this summer, and that is your green insert. Um, when we get to the budget section of that, uh, you will notice that I had anticipated the trip would cost um, 
$1,200. That was in early January, and realistically, um, it's going to be $1,695. So um, that change will be reflected in the budget as well. It does go without saying, however, that these trips will be self-sustaining endeavors or we won't go. Okay, so these are not things that will be subsidized um, in any, any form. In attempting to substantiate a responsible budget, I surveyed communities that offer comparable programs and services to those of Cape Elizabeth. Even though the communities surveyed don't offer as extensive a program as we do, the data certainly is valuable to us. And if you refer to page 16, which is the last page in your budget packet, um, you can, I'll highlight some of those comparisons. <clears throat> One thing that is not on your data summary sheet is that, um, and it probably is, is, is pretty well understood, we do offer more services under our, uh, under our umbrella um, than any of the other communities, and that probably is reflected in, in the amount of our total budget. Um, we collect the most revenues. We have the lowest percent of town appropriation. and. Um, I think that just so that you could get a sense for how we have done over the past three years, um, even though our budget has increased, our bottom line virtually has decreased. And certainly the um, percent of the total budget being subsidized by the town um, has also decreased. So we've gone from 17.9% um, to 15.4% for um, the FY95 year. Also, um, in that comparison, you do not see how much money um, we actually spend in subsidizing our pool. Uh, community, community pools do not make money, and 28% of our town subsidy, or um, a dollar value of $25,268, is dedicated to pool operations that are not covered in revenues. This truly is a bare bones budget. Um, there's no fluff. Um, everything is spelled out for you. There are no skeletons in the closet. And without a doubt, I think Cape Elizabeth Community Services provides more optional programs and services for its citizens than any other community. For 16 cents net to tax, the payback is two or threefold to our community members and services that really enhance the quality of life in Cape Elizabeth. And um, and that's for all citizens. Our programming starts um, now even with Lamaze classes going right up through our senior citizens. In the pages to follow, um, I have given you a delineation of expenditures by program so that you can see the actual cost per program and the, am and the amount of administrative time that's spent in each of the areas. Um, you also have a summary of anticipated revenues. And um, at this point, why don't I go through our expenditure and, and revenue, revenue accounts and highlight um, significant increases or decreases from FY94's budget. Under the area of administration, um, there's a decrease in expenditures due to the realignment of the director's and assistant director's time. The director's time um, at least some of it has been transferred to the central office, office account. And the assistant director, who o also oversees the extended school care program, found that realistically she was spending much more time in that area. So that's, that's a matter of transfer. Um, in adult education, um, once again, the assistant director's time was um, transferred to the extended school care account. In aquatics, the significant increase was in the uh, aquatic director's medical coverage, and we increased that to parallel other unit coverages. Summer program, it actually says that there's a decrease, but after um, calculating the cost of um, the European uh, trip, um, there actually is a slight increase, and um, that increase will be covered by um, increase in revenues. Extended school care, there's an increase from 25 to 50 percent to reflect the actual time of that assistant director. 
and in senior citizens an increase to reflect the actual administrative time spent for, for programming. On the revenue side, um, in adult education, we anticipate um, a decrease in state subsidy. Um, in, in aquatics, we have a slight increase due to the expanded pool programs, um, not only for children but also for adults. Um, I think that the greatest growth in the pool programs is for our preschoolers. Uh, we have expanded the lesson program not only on Saturdays but also during off kindergarten hours for um, the four-year-old and the five-year-old population and those classes have filled to uh, maximum enrollments so there's an indication to us out there that we're not doing enough so we have definitely expanded those programs. Um, on the adult side we have expanded fitness programs in the pool as well as um, a master swim program which continues to grow. The summer program um, any increase or decrease will be offset by revenues and that the revenues are slightly up and that would be due to the um, increase in the capability camps going from uh, about $46,000 last year to over $64,000 this year. So that's where that increase occurs. Senior citizens, a slight increase due to more members paying dues. Um, we send out over 200 newsletters monthly to our senior citizens and um, their enrollment has, has exceeded the 200 mark. In extended school care, um, the increase in revenues is based on the actual enrollment projections um, for this year. As we strive for continuous improvement in our programs and services, we always welcome and encourage feedback from citizens. As you consider this budget, please remember not only the number and variety of programs and services provided, but more importantly, the number of citizens impacted by community services. Each year, our audience encompasses um, infants to senior citizens with vast ranges of interest and incomes. Once again, I look forward to your support. Um, do I have any questions? Is there any change in the tax impact? No, there isn't. No change. It's exactly the same. And the other question, um, do you have any idea of the, the number of scholarship, <coughs> last scholarship year we, participation? La last year I did an analysis of, of what our scholarship figures were and um, I think we've seen a significant drop in requests for scholarships this year. I know in the extended school care program there are less scholarships. Last year we averaged $1,000 a month and I know that we're less than that this year. Um, I can't say that all of the bills are being met, but the requests for scholarship has, are not as great. What about summer programs? That's hard to say. We're not into summer yet. Last year we had more requests um, than we had had any other year. Um, they exceeded about $6,000 in last year's summer budget, and I'm not sure what, how those requests will come in this year. How does that impact some of these capability trips? The capability camps that are held on campus um, where we hire directors to run the camp if a child qualifies for a scholarship and we can absorb that money, we do. Any trip that goes outside of Cape Elizabeth, um, there are no scholarship opportunities for those trips. And in the administrative costs of some of those trips, like the European Adventure, mm -hmm. that's to be recovered by the fee that's being charged. Yes. That's nothing that the, that the system's going to absorb. No, it isn't. Okay. In fact, one of the staff positions will be paid, and the other will go paying half fare. Um, under summer program, mm -hmm. um, for day camp, are you expecting um, a smaller enrollment in the day camp or is that being shifted somewhere else? Um, are you on the revenue section? Yeah, I'm looking at um, 
The, the, the fiscal year 95 is substantially less than the fiscal year okay. 94 under day camp. Last year, we decreased um, the number of weeks in the program. Okay. Okay, we've gone from a six-week, a full six-week program to a five-week program uh -huh. with um, extended school ser services on both ends of the program. Okay. Okay, and we did that because school was starting before Labor Day <coughs> instead of after Labor Day. And in an effort to get the buildings clean, we really need to vacate the buildings by August 1st. Mm -hmm. So we, in fact, um, the expenditures you'll notice in salaries for summer programming staff would be down um, proportionately, and that would be because it's a five-week five program week. instead of a six-week program. And that we had last year. Uh -huh. Even though the budget was built for six, we actually had five. Okay. And um, on the uh, trips, I'm just curious um, about the insurance, mm -hmm. the liability or whatever. Where does that come from? The liability, what we do for our insurance carriers, we give them a complete itinerary of every trip that we're doing. Um, the European trip this year, um, we're also going through a travel agent. So there will be some insurance there. But our insurance carrier uh, will get a, a very complete delineation of exactly what we're doing. Uh -huh. um, all of the, the parent meetings, um, the waivers, um, rules and regulations, um, certifications of the staff, and so forth. And uh, to date, they've been satisfied with the information okay. we've given them. Kelly. Community services utilizes the school campus. Mm -hmm. as a whole. What is the impact of the next two years of the middle school elementary going to do to your programming? Well, I think that impact is definitely going to start this summer with some of the programming that we have done at the middle school in the past. We will probably be confined to just using the gym area. Um, in the future, I know that the extended school care program will be impacted next year in terms of available space for their program during the school day. I'm not sure that that's exactly been decided. Um, it seems to be a little bit up in the air, but it could impact the number of children that we take um, in the kindergarten program to be sure. But we're flexible. We can, we can make do and we can go almost anywhere. Like that attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you said that the full-time staff, uh, you budgeted a 3% raise. What did you do for the part-time staff? Uh, the part-time staff, um, at least, we have a scale um, which really delineates how much they get paid from um, CITs right up through our adult ed staff. And um, that's remained fairly constant. We have not changed that. Okay. And with the ADA expenditures and the mention of the interpreter, that interpreter for the audience is for hearing impaired? That's correct. I, somebody might think it's for English as a second language or something. I just thought I'd make that clear. Um, any of the expenditures for either of these programs, are these expenditures uh, likely to come back to you in additional revenue? I'm not sure I understand your question. Will the state reimburse you? No. Or is there any federal monies available for meeting ADA? Thank you. I didn't think so. And, and I do want to thank you very much. The um, request is, uh, I think it's generally known, was that there be no increases in budgets. And it was a real pleasure to read one where there wasn't. Thank you. I just want to comment on the, uh, as just I think most people are aware, but perhaps uh, Carly, you're not quite aware. We have, I asked Sue two years ago to work with me uh, and others to develop, really to reorganize our custodial transportation and maintenance departments. Um, gave her a title, systems um, analyst or something like that. Anyway, working on systems. What started that was the fact that community services had very successfully um, computerized the use of buildings. Uh, having worked in another system where my office first and then finally community services was responsible for scheduling school space and I know what a headache it is. I recognize there was a good deal of organizational um, 
skill going into that piece of the uh, the uh, operation, and I thought maybe we could tap into that and schedule buses and so forth. Uh, Sue has done a superb job of that, and we carry some of her salary in our central office budget for that purpose. Um, the she's underpaid, uh, but. Uh, I, while we're on the subject of reorganization, that is an ongoing process. Um, and at some point every year, we sit down and sort of discuss how we, whether we change the title or <laughs> change the assignment or what have you. But um, right now, we're talking about the fact that community services use, uh, as well as our own school programs, use the buildings a lot. Now, admittedly, we're going to be going through a tough two years in all of this, but we're really trying to put in place a design that will carry us through when we have new buildings. Um, frankly, we're, we want to look at the hospital model of housekeeping. We've got to be able to clean, well, I'm assuming it works. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting with two people here, I mean, please reassure me. I <laughs> there, there are resources in this community that have direct impact on how that operation goes, and I think you need to tap into those people. Well, we'll there are people in this community who are responsible, that live in this community. That okay, are, good. Well, I'll ask you later. Uh, we have visited USM facilities, and it was interesting because of the gentleman there who was really in charge of the custodial operations told us he called them housekeeping, and he had come from a hospital background, and this started his thinking about the issue of we've got to learn how to clean while people are using the buildings. I mean, it's right now we're struggling to get, you know, clean, I mean, empty space to do the cleaning, and it's, it's very awkward. And um, uh, actually, it's really kind of comical. Uh, Bob Bennett and I, both of whom spent a little time in the hospital in the last couple of years, were, were talking about having watched how people were cleaning. <laughs> it's on your mind. You think about it when you're in your hospital bed. Uh, I think those, that kind of ongoing organization and attempt to rethink what we're doing is, is part of what I'm talking about with Sue's um, system organizational input into that. So there's a little, we're getting a real um, big return for our money as well as the program itself. Thank you. Tonight, I, tonight leads me to understand that we're going to continue her services. She hasn't said no. <laughs> Because I believe we initially set this up, it was going to be short, hopefully short term. But. Well, we're, we're, I think each, each phase, I mean, uh, we're really kind of in design development here. Um, and what is critical is that we get this down in writing on paper for the new building and every aspect of this from the custodial to the, you know, really working in the, the day use of buildings as well as the community services and so on and so forth. And we're getting there, but we still have a way to go. It's still a challenge. Definitely. And There's Sue a lot of continuous improvement mm. and What needed. surprises me is Sue, both Sue and her assistants also coach in our system mm. and that, and varsity sports. So. There's good time management. There may not be a lot of personal time, but there's good time management. Probably no personal time. Yeah, I feel guilty about that, but I think that... <laughs> For about a minute. <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, but... Um, but your staff has taken up some of... Taken up some of your... They definitely have. Um, the way our office has operated in the past, it's a, it's a small staff, and, and one of the things that I didn't share with you when I started calling around to get some of the budget statistics from the other community services offices, um, and, and none of them have a setup like us, so I tried to compare apples to apples. Most of them have a full-time recreation director and, and who has an assistant, who has a secretary, and then there, there is also an adult ed director who has an evening supervisor and also a secretary. So you're looking at departments who have uh, six employees um, to our three or four. And um, there's no question that, and I was saying this to Connie, it's difficult to be a manager and a worker. And she's made me more of a manager, which means in some respects, I need to be less of a worker, but our staff is too small for me to be less of a worker. And um, sometimes that's difficult, because there just aren't enough hours in the day to do both. Can I just, can I just ask a question about these trips, which look phenomenal. Sure. They really do. Um, 
but I was just wondering what kind of guidelines you're giving the parents and the children as far as your behavior on these trips, because I know when the trips are closer to home, you can call the parents and have them come get mm -hmm. their kids, but mm -hmm. it might be a little difficult in these circumstances. Well, last year, um, we did the Western Adventure, and we called um, the parents and the students together um, at a mandatory meeting, and there was a contract that the parent and child signed after we discussed it. Um, and that contract did say, it did give the rules and regulations. It also said that what the cons uh, consequences were and what the parent's responsibility would be should that child need to be sent home. And we are very clear that the parent would be responsible for the liability once that child stepped on the plane. The parent would be responsible for any extra incurred cost as a result of having to make special arrangements. And um, they clearly understood, you know, what our expectations were, and um, we had no problems. And I, we will have those same kind kind of meetings this year. And I think that um, they understand that we mean what we say. So I don't anticipate any any problems. Okay. Rosemary. I would say that the um, students, so the age group that these are going on, the ninth grade to 12th grade entering, um, know very well Mrs. Weatherby means what she says. So I, I just wanted to have Sue be able to say this in public here that we all heard this. I understand. I was just trying to emphasize the fact that the rumors around that if you don't do what you're supposed to, you're out of here. So, and it's not a rumor anymore, it's an actual fact. Yeah. Um, I had a question. I wish I could remember what it was. <laughs> One of the um, concerns that Charlie brought up uh, is with the construction over the next two years. Mm -hmm. um, I, and, and I do understand your flexibility, and we certainly have seen it in action. Uh, but what if uh, half of the space, or do we have any idea what portion of the space that these programs use during the summer will be Totally inaccessible. Well, the um, major piece this summer, outside of stripping asbestos and all that stuff out of there, which will be, uh, it has real implications for packing up, cleaning out, and so forth, which, you know, having been through some moves recently, people have some idea what that means, uh, will be the parking lot. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, that is critical so that we will have access to the site and parking for <coughs> To the duration. The space in between the two buildings is going to be construction space. The portables will be on the Pond Cove, I mean the uh, Thomas Memorial Library side. We'll cut into, of course, the playground material. On the other hand, we'll, we'll manage. Uh, and um, I'm not as clear about whether I think whether there'll be any availability, probably at the far end of Pine Cove, there'll be a little availability for parking and so forth. Uh, but I think basically that's, uh, we just have to get used to the idea that that's going to be a major change. And that uh, what that means to, I guess that field is still gonna be accessible, the middle school field. I don't have any reason why that wouldn't mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. for Pee Wee soccer in the fall. Um, it's a question we can, you know, ask the architects to see if there's something we're not aware of. I don't know of any reason why that wouldn't be available. I think that um, certainly it's not going to impact us any more or less than anybody else, and we'll just have to work around it. Well, the only reason I raise it is we charge fees for what you do, mm -hmm. uh, and school will go on. And I, I just didn't know if the revenue side would be shifted. I would think that we could be creative in, in, in terms of what facilities we're utilizing for our programs. Thank you. Anything else for Sue? Outstanding job as always, Sue. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Um, Sharon is here to t uh, speak about the, I think she wants to talk about the uh, secretary. Oh, okay. You want to you want to talk about the second Yeah. Okay. Okay. You may have the hot seat chair. Or the podium. <laughs> Whatever you want. 
This is fine. Um, you heard earlier this evening that uh, Barbara Cummings, who is our ed tech person in the planning center, is moving on to bigger and greener pastures. Uh, she's um, working for the community services. Uh, we're really going to miss her, and uh, we wish her, her well in her new job. Um, I, in talking with uh, Connie last week, uh, she said with this position being vacated, that it might be a position that you would consider cutting out of the budget for next year. And I just wanted to um, make a few comments this evening to persuade you not to think about doing that. Um, the um, Planning Center program um, is really a, a really wonderful program in, in our um, guidance department. Uh, it's a resource center, um, and the ed tech person who's there supervises and manages that resource center, um, keeps it open uh, all day long during the school day, five days a week. In the planning center, there are uh, about 3,000 books, college catalogs, about uh, six or 700 uh, college videos. Um, every piece of information that exists in our school about careers, um, post-secondary planning, college uh, planning, there is a, a new $4,000 uh, system that Cape Elizabeth is the only high school in Maine, and we were for a while the only high school in New England. Uh, we're a demonstration site for College View, and it's a $4,000 system that's on loan to us, which is a computer search system, a CD-ROM, which plays um, college videos on the uh, computer monitor, and it's a, a college search system which is in the planning center. Uh, it's a, a very rich, very heavily used resource in the high school. And um, it's a, a program that's very envied, I think, by um, other schools that visit us, very admired by college admissions representatives that visit us, and um, just a wonderful resource for our students. And we'd like very much uh, to keep that ed tech person um, with us so that that center and all those resources can be made available to the students at all time. Um, by eliminating the position, uh, it forces us to cut back on the times that the center is open. Um, at this time, you know, we're keeping it open three periods a day. Um, we'll try to make sure that we keep it open at least two periods a day as time goes on that uh, the, the time that the center is open and also the programs, the job shadows, the career fairs, um, the interview program for juniors, um, we're just not sure how many of those activities we'll be able to continue um, to keep, keep doing and we'll have to examine the ones that we'll keep um, and the ones that we won't be able to do anymore without the support staff there to help us do it. And um, I just wanted to make you aware of how valuable the program is to us and um, how, uh, how very much we'd like to keep it, um, if possible. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask about the program. I, I have one. I guess it would be helpful to me not having a student in the high school yet and only remembering you know, the guidance department from my high school days to have some sort of delineation of what everybody associated with the guidance department is currently doing. Because I, I, hear, what, I hear what you're saying, that there needs to be somebody there to supervise and direct and, and that kind of thing. But I don't have an idea how that person has been fitting into the rest of the guidance department. So that would be helpful to me and probably to some other. Uh, the person is, is a member of the guidance department. It's a support staff person. Uh, the room is downstairs on the second floor in what used to be an, uh, an old media room. And um, all of the program materials and activities are, are in that room. Um, the activities are developed and supervised um, by the guidance counselors in a weekly planning meeting. And we participate in the activities, carrying them out. We're not there um, every minute of the day down there while the, the students are coming in and out to get the resources, but we do plan all the programs and activities that take place there. Um, Sharon, I have a couple of questions. And, and one is, um, 
Could you tell me why um, the planning center is only open during the hours that schools open? That's just something I, I, I was just thinking as I was looking through um, the options, and certainly one of the options is only to have it open two days a week. Or that's right. You know, that that is one of the options. Uh, it's uh, an ed tech position. The person is paid by the hour, and that's what's budgeted or what has been budgeted in the past is for the person to work. I, I guess my question hours. is. Um, have you thought of having it open at 7 a.m. and closing early on one day and have it opening at 9.30 and stay open until 4 in the afternoon? I, I guess I'm wondering why it is exactly when school starts that it opens and exactly when mm -hmm. school ends that it closes when I would expect, having read the statistics of how many of our juniors are taking full loads, that their participation might be enhanced if they had that 30 minutes before or uh, 30 minutes after? Uh, we operate at the hours of the school now. Uh, those are what's, what's been put in the budget. It could be operated more. We well, could use the same hours, just on a different schedule? Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, the assumption is that students will use it during their study periods when they're free, during lunch. That, you know, they'll go in and use the center while they're in the, during the school day. And have you uh, received feedback from the students on how they use this valuable resource and, and how important it is to them? Or is it more an easy place to get the information that could otherwise uh, come in the mail? Or mm -hmm. just exactly what is the draw to our planning center? Um, yes, we do a, um, a student services survey every spring, every senior class before they exit. Uh, we, we have a survey form where they can uh, evaluate all the activities, all the student ser services that they get throughout high school. And that's such things as career fairs, um, interview fairs, um, uh, specific uh, publications they get, the uh, student newsletters, um, the interest inventories that they take, and they get to rate them for us, you know, one through five, one being highest. The two most highly rated activities by students in their senior year as they look back are uh, the junior interview program gets top, top rating, and so does the planning center as being helpful to them. And it is helpful to them, um, and they really, really like it. If this were not budgeted for next year at all, how would the guidance department manage without that staff? I'm not saying without a planning center. I'm saying without a funded staff position to man, if you will, um, mm -hmm. that center. Well, I've started to think about that. <laughs> uh, and it might be a part of the packet that you got tonight. Uh, it would be um, open less time. We would have to figure out, will it be two periods a day? Will it be two days a week? It would be supervised by one of the guidance counselors. We'd go down there and, and supervise the center and the materials. Uh, we would not have the support staff capability of that person who did all the detail of setting up the junior interview, who did the detail of um, getting the student their, their job shadow passes and appointments for the things they did. So we would have to do less of those things because we wouldn't have that support staff person to do it. I, or I can pick up some of that through the remaining um, secretaries in the guidance office, but cut back something else that they do. I mean, otherwise, we just we just can't do those things. We're going to have to make choices and um, not do as much. Are there certain times of the year that the planning center is more busy or inundated more than others, or is it steady? It is truly busy all year long. In the fall, September through uh, February, it's it's loaded with with seniors. Uh, in the middle of February, we start the junior class, we give them their orientation materials, and the juniors move into the planning center. Uh, the sophomores are taken in when they have their interest inventory and are uh, told to you know, start uh, doing research on careers, and they're in and out of there. So those three grades are, are using it all the time, and, and truly the students do use it. They truly like it, they truly value it, and it, it's a wonderful, um, it's an admirable uh, resource that we have in our school and a very enviable resource. And I, I realize that it's something special that um, not many schools have, but we do have it and it's a wonderful state of the arts program. It's great. <laughs>
Chair, there are two guidance counselors yes. right now, and how many secretaries? And two. two. Two secretaries. Plus mm -hmm. an ed tech. The two secretaries. Uh, one is involved is a secretary slash registrar. She does the college application transcripts, uh, registrar taking in maintaining student records, sending them out for transfer students. Class rank, all um, scholarship applications such as national merit um, and all the scholarship um, programs that we do as well as scholarship competitions. And uh, is, is busy with that all year. I think she has uh, a less busy time the last two weeks of February. She's not busy every single minute. Otherwise, she is busy you know, with these activities. Uh, the other secretary is a receptionist, handles all correspondence going out of the guidance office. Um, she helps me do the master schedule building every year, does all the input, output, printing, printing up of student schedules, class lists, um, does adding and dropping of, of changing student schedules, helps assisting with the opening of school, uh, helps us publish the study guide every year in January. Uh, helps us run the MEA testing, the ERB testing, the National French exam, the, the Spanish exam, the AP exams in the spring, and is responsible for the awards night and all the boys, girls state, honor society and all that kind of thing. And they're busy <laughs> all the time. There's very little downtime for either one of them. So um, that was uh, what I meant when I said for staff time, for these people, you know, we would have to stop doing some of these things. And we like doing them all. We think that they're wonderful programs. You're getting new software for scheduling and that kind of thing. In the budget right. this spring. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Would that, do you foresee that cutting down on some of the time these staff members need? Um, I think different. we'll be able to do scheduling better, a better schedule, faster, uh, quicker. Uh, the, the software we're interested in builds a schedule in four and a half minutes versus the one we have now takes six hours and you usually build about 20 schedules before you get a new one. So you can see time savings coming from, from that um, in just how the software works. Um, still printing student schedules, class lists, getting them out, dispersing and adding and dropping. But we should save some time there with that process in another year. One, one more question. Has there been any thought given to um, having volunteers help out with this kind of activity? Uh, yes, Connie and I talked about that, and, and certainly that is a choice. It's, it's not the best choice. Um, the sophistication of the activities here um, really rely on a trained person who knows how to do it, does it well with some knowledge and sophistication. And having a volunteer come for one or two days a week, not doing the activity consistently, having four or five people um, work at job shadows, for example. I mean, I wouldn't expect to find an adult volunteer who would who would donate their week to us or do all of these complex activities for free. I think we'd have probably a roster of volunteers. Um, it wouldn't work as well, but certainly, you know, it's a, I think, a less choice option. Thank you. Um, You've pretty much given us an itemized job description of the two um, guidance people that are housed with the guidance counselors. Do you have, I didn't notice in my packet, I did see uh, um, an idea of what the resources and activities were within the program, but do you have a job description, Sharon, of what the EdTech one did? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I do. Uh -huh. Is it brief or is it complicated? Uh, I have an extra copy, which... I can give you if you'd like. If it's brief, would the rest of the board benefit by hearing what this position did? Can, uh, can I just ask a question? Yes. The number of college admission representatives that come, do you know, have any idea what number? I've never counted them, but it's a lot. Um, we're just heavily visited. We're seen as a good resource for college applicants. Uh, I'm just going to guess and say we're probably visited by 300 college admissions reps. So 
So again, that's so another coordinating. That is coordinated out of this, this room as well, and it's a place where students meet college admissions reps. I'm just guessing, it, you know, it's a lot. Um, yeah, that's what this paper says, 300. Does it? Yeah. I can just sort of briefly skim through this. Uh, the person supervises the planning center, which is filled with materials that need to be supervised. Some of them are very expensive, such as our new computer program. Uh, take care of the uh, materials there, catalogs, view books, maintain bulletin boards, keep files of college applications, assist students in how to find information, set up job shadows, help organize career fairs. Um, that's um, scheduling students in, making sure they have passes to get out of class. Um, let me see. We have uh, a speaker program for classrooms, like the Foreign Language Week. Uh, we make a, uh, a senior newsletter every week during the fall, uh, and that goes out. Uh, we have a newsletter to senior parents, junior parents, a handbook uh, that's mailed to all parents on uh, post-secondary planning. Uh, schedule organized college reps. Um, just and, and just being there and keeping the center open and helping students find material, sign it out to them, uh, help them find what they're, they're looking for in the center, and supervising it. Scott, do you know what the personnel cost is for this position? Any questions? Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Just one other question. Could this, could this be a part-time position? Yes, it could. In fact, that might be a good uh, compromise between the part-time person and, um, you know, by, by our taking um, some of the time for the planning center to be open. I think we might remain pretty accessible to students. Um, that's really my goal, is to, that room is filled with all the information our students need in their junior and senior year, and, and I just want to keep it accessible to them. Um, so part-time might, might work really well. You don't know if there have been any um, figures kept of the number of students that come per period, or, you know, I'm wondering if it really needs to be open six periods a day, five days a week. You know, are there are there peak periods in a day or peak periods in a in a week? You know, these are things mm -hmm. that be interesting yeah. to know. Well, I, I think we could we from yeah. Our predecessor. I don't have that information, but um, part time is better than no time. Uh, and I think if we had a schedule of uh, availability and it were published, it were known by students, they could plan that into their schedules of when they would get into the planning center. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Sharon. Okay, we had uh, our last item tonight um, is system wide accounts. Um, Scott, you want to join me? We can run these through fairly quickly uh, so that we're free to start with a middle school on Thursday, uh, Pond Cove on the following Thursday. And Actually, I, I don't think we need to go into a great deal of detail, otherwise we'll be here forever, but we can at least hit the highlights. And what we're talking about when we say system-wide would be beginning on page, page 18. Whoops, wait a minute. 17. 17, excuse me. Sorry, can I put that one point sure. of clarification on the guidance? because. Mark pointed this out. There's a, there's a reduction in the teacher salaries on that account. What is that? That's not related to this. No, we, have, we haven't taken anything out of the budget and guidance. No, but I, but 
but there it does show a decrease and yeah that was that I think that was one of those clear. assignments of salaries that uh, that was just wasn't that the social worker okay. mm, wasn't that, that last of. year's social work not Wait a second. Where are we, Officer? Of the I'm sorry. On this, yeah. um, what page? Page twelve. Page twelve. Page twelve. Yeah. Just yeah. Under that we haven't taken anything out of that. I think that's simply reassigning. Reassigning of staff. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Right. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Ahead. Beginning on page seventeen, central office. I uh, would call your attention as far as the uh, line forty-one one one salaries clerical. There's an increase there, some of which is the uh, the increase, 3% increase in salary for the staff. Uh, but much more of that is attributable to the fact that we have extended uh, two of our central office people who were working slightly less than full time in one case, and the other one was uh, only three days a week, and we've extended that to five. Uh, we've given explanations of that as we've gone along to the finance subcommittee um, and basically I had a Scott and I just jotted down some notes uh, I have asked Scott to reorganize the business office and to make this much more of a team approach uh, we are training our, our people in a variety of ways and trying to upgrade our, our accounting system um, right now we this year it seems to be most of our effort has gone into trying to make things accurate <laughs> And, um, but I think we, you know, we have uh, certainly some visions of being increasingly efficient. Uh, we have put a lot more in writing than we used to. Um, you'll notice on this little sheet, which is really bare bones, but trying to indicate how I'm asking Scott to handle business manager position. Uh, we created a team for the team management and support services. Um, you'll see more about that later, but that's just getting the concept out there. I've asked him to do field oversight of food service development. Scott, I didn't spell that. You did. Yes. <laughs> development of teamwork in the business office, which I really think is important, and I'm pleased to say that Scott's managed to bring that along. Obviously, he's going to be extremely busy with the building project. We do have the files are set up. The accounting is in place, and it's going to be a, a big issue for the next few years. And I do... Uh, we're trying to make sure that we keep good communication going back and forth between the two of us as well as obviously ultimately with the board. Um, so those are the reasons for that increase. Can I ask a question? Mm, sure. On the building project, which will require more clerical work of processing bills, that right. type of thing, are we going to be able to handle it with the staff that we have? Yeah, we've, uh, we've currently got uh, a filing system set up in the office where all the bills, as they're paid, are put in the filing cabinets. We've, we've pretty much established that routine already. Because I know in projects of this size, it's not unusual to hire additional clerical. Yeah. Right. And that's one of the, uh, uh, the position that was three days. It's now five days. Uh, we're really very fortunate with the skills that that particular person has, and that will be part of Okay. In this, in this clerical line where we budgeted 91 to 710, that's not the actual. And it would be nice to know what the actual is, because I think it will make less of an impact than increase. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Because I think that's what the town council would look at. It'd say, well, you've got yeah. a 16.2% increase yeah. in clerical when actually we don't have that. Right. We've already budgeted. I mean, we already have approved that in this yeah. year's budget, those increases. I think that would truly reflect the true cost. Okay. Good. Excuse me. There's anything particularly remarkable as we go on through here. Um, I'm only going to call to your attention the things that I think. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask. I'm not on the building committee. And so that increase in central office staff time attributable to the building project, is that somehow kept track of so that we take a look at some of the costs being absorbed in our operating budget that is actually part of the project? That, well, it, I'm not saying necessarily that we charge the building project for it, but it somehow uh, be able to account for the fact that X number of hours uh, was absorbed within the operations budget to, you know. Well, I have no, I mean, I've been through building projects, and I can assure you that going from a three-day to a five-day position just on that one issue alone justifies it. Um, and, and I'm sure that it totally does. every week, but yeah. there are other issues in there, and we are, are. But I would certainly feel comfortable in 
attributing one day a week. Okay. I just think that that's important. And mm -hmm. also with the extension of Mr. Jewett to the Pond Cove Middle School project, oh, yeah. if we could somehow uh, make okay. sure that it's I do, I do think stated. that would be useful to, okay. for the town council to understand yes. the cost. That I agree with you. And there are, other, there are other costs. There are you know, staff it's a good development point. time costs and things to make this actually work. So I, I think it would be good if we could keep some kind of accounting so they know what we're observing. I'm not saying charge it off. No, no, no. Just know what no. the value is. So we will be able to agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's a good point. I mean, it's, it's just reading articles in the paper, it's clear. And besides, I know a lot of the, you know, some of the things that have gone on in other projects. It's not at all uncommon for districts to assign an administrator full time to building projects of less complexity than this. So, you know, we're basically doing this on a, on a short string. Um, okay, moving on. I'd just like to reference Oops. legal. <clears throat> we're doing much better. Evidently, you've decreased the amount for legal. I mean, we seem to be doing much better Wait, than we had months. four to five years ago. Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, and, we were talking, yeah. you know, $25,000, dollars yeah. a year. It's, it's so hard to know. Um, many times we, we can go for months or at least, uh, you know, weeks without needing to make a phone call. And um, then all of a sudden there'll be five phone calls in one day for a variety of reasons. But it certainly does pay to make the phone call and not wait until you've got something hanging over your head. It, and besides, you never know. I mean, That's true. You, can, you can have something happen, it's just unpredictable, and there it goes. But to see those costs go down, I mean, something's working right mm -hmm. so, overall. Okay. Better utilization. Very true. Okay, moving on. System wide instruction. Uh, the biggest issue I want to call to your attention here is 4111, uh, which is staff development. We run a small amount in here, which has been used to support the, uh, the activities like uh, stipends for the uh, um, exceptionality course um, and a couple of other just kind of general things that we've done. Uh, I added 19, actually, I added 20,000. Um, I don't know where the other 500 is, but anyway, it's an increase of 19,500. Um, because of some of the issues we were talking about earlier tonight on the placement, we have uh, uh, middle school and, and Ponco administrators and myself have met with Jim Curry from the university who has developed some dandy materials and differentiation of curriculum which will fit our needs beautifully because uh, actually his specialty is gifted and talented, uh, but he has also done a lot with uh, special ed along the way. Um, and what he has developed over the several years he's been at Gorham is approaches he's now uh, working with a number of school districts uh, that can range. The, the, you don't need a whole lot of training to get started using them. It shows practical ways for teachers to take a core concept and change them into assignments that are different for different kids. Uh, but it's still the same concept. In other words, that bugaboo of having to teach 20 different curriculum, no one curriculum with maybe five or six different ways of, of um, thinking that through. Uh, it's very practical, very hands-on, and I'm excited to be able to get into that. I think actually listening to the foreign language teachers, that might be useful for them too if they haven't seen some of it. Um, uh, and he's, I have a lot of respect for Jim Curry. I think he's really a good person uh, working for our needs. In addition, I'd like to continue to do some team building things with people. Um, and I think that the, um, um, for instance, we do the language arts, the math curriculum. These are ongoing and extremely important issues. We'd like to get started doing a few things on science. Uh, so the, the reason I've got that in there is that there are some needs at all three buildings that aren't in their budgets. And I also think that this is an opportunity for the board, the superintendent, to uh, use some kind of put into place what's called the top-down support of bottom-up change. Um, and there has to be some place for it, so I just stuck it in there. Can, can I just say that it, it would be helpful to have an overall sheet of all yes. the staff development sure. um, requests, both here and from the buildings? We do have. I know we have pieces. We have pieces right, of things, right, but if I we understand. could have, 
have it in one place, that would be good. Okay. Reasonable enough. Okay. Computer uh, coordinator. Uh, actually, what that is is uh, I've changed that title in there to maintenance. What we now have is uh, um, an arrangement with Marty Watts, who keeps cannibalizing the old twoies and keeping them going, and we pay him against a log of per hour. Uh, activities and since we're still going to have to keep those things going next year I uh, we may not need what's in there and it doesn't go to him as a lump sum it goes as you know an hourly log for uh, repairs but that's where it is we did have some money in a system-wide computer account which Scott has transferred to the computer accounts in various schools that's just wiped out and this is coordinator is entirely misleading term it's payment for Keeping those old machines going. Basically. Okay, I was just because we're looking for somebody for um, to do um, an, an analysis or yes. that kind of thing. And yes, just well, that's th that's really another part of, and we may use some of that, but we may also that's another piece for the uh, uh, for the, that little bit I've got there in system wide. Um, could come out of either one. Let me see. Anything else in there that's. I don't think anything else there is, is changed particularly. Well, what is it, may I just ask, what is um, volunteer services? That's, is that mm -hmm. something brand new, 4622? I think that's just a budget for the volunteer coordinator. Yeah, that's a new account this year. Uh, the volunteer coordinator has always had supplies that have come from various areas, and she established well, so now her she's own. got her. Yeah. She has her own budget okay. this year. Okay. We sort of took it out of everybody's lines. Yeah. <laughs> whether they knew it or not. <laughs> um, okay, health services. Scott, did you change that line there on 4111? That hasn't been changed yet. Okay. We do an upgrade on the budget that's, really well. That's the one nurse at the middle school. Uh, Scott had left the Pine Cove nurse in the Pine Cove uh, Center. The money is in the budget, but it's a matter of transferring it over. You may recall that I'm that we have at least brought in a recommendation of dropping the position at the high, nurse position at the high school, increasing the hours somewhat at um, Pond Cove so that we have two nurses um, and working out their schedules so that somebody is available and, uh, and continuing the health aid position at, um, at Pond Cove. We, so actually, we, we need to change that number, mm -hmm. but the money is in the budget in another place. That's under 8700 We did agree as part of our settlement with the bus driver's custodians to do some medical exams. That's what that is. The rest of it is essentially in line with what we have had. So how are we going to ha handle the kindergarten and some of those elementary students who will be at the high school? Mm -hmm. Well, we are going to work it out so that the nurse has some time to check in there. Um, and there is a phone. So you're not going to utilize the aid? When aid? Didn't you have a health aid? Well, we have a health aid at, at Pond Cove. Okay. Now, we may move that around a little bit, too, when we actually we haven't increased those hours. We may look at our budget eventually, come back with the need to do that to some degree. And we do have a health secretary in the high school, which I really haven't factored into all of this, but those pieces are available to us. Okay, we have the money in here for the ADA, which I've highlighted before, ongoing projects. Um, student transportation, the uh, the first thing that might catch your eye is a decrease in regular salary. Scott, you want to explain that's really not the decrease yeah. that it looks actually, like. Well, actually, it was a it was an increase Excuse of sixteen percent, and uh, where that was is our current transportation director was be his salary was being broken out to transportation as well as maintenance. So now all of his salary appears under the transportation account uh, where it should be. Plus, of course, regular yeah. the Plus, of course, contract regular increase. increases for that unit. Um, I don't think there's anything particularly remarkable here. As you look down through those accounts, they're either uh, the same as they were, slightly decreased. Uh, we, of course, have already taken out the 
lease purchase of a bus this year. We told you earlier that we did not get approval by the state, so we wouldn't get reimbursement if we went forward with that. So we've made a judgment we can get by here without doing it. We, oh, we do have on line 4728 a used truck. We, maybe we can get a new truck for that amount of money, but I'm not sure. <laughs> you want to explain that? One? Yeah, that's, uh, we currently have a, a navy blue truck, I guess navy blue or primer gray, I don't know what you want to call it, but the thing is not safe or fit for the road. And we need to retire its services and replace it with something. We use a truck for hauling trash. The trash. Hauling. Uh, and a variety of odd jobs, so. Um. On 4730, decreased equipment repair. Mm -hmm. Considering some of the things that have happened in the last couple of years with bus mm. repair, is that wise? Good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, with gas and so forth, you never know yeah. what's gonna happen. We've been really remarkably fortunate with the <coughs> Uh, gas rates. Um, did you have anything in particular in mind with that one, Scott? Uh, actually, uh, Sue, you put that together with Charlie. Did Charlie come up with any rationale for that, or what did he actually decrease? Seven thousand from eight to one thousand for, yeah. for equipment repair. For equipment repair, I think that's. I think you're thinking in terms of vehicle maintenance, yeah. and vehicle maintenance is in uh, okay. line forty-four thirty, contract repair town. I think that's actually physical okay. equipment. Okay, uh, such as jacks or, uh, you know, impact guns or whatever. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay. I think that's probably what you're looking at there. Yeah. Um, on the local problems, House City, we're still carrying at 15,000, uh, which is actually down from what it was a year or two ago. Um, as we get to the final stages of this budget, I could suggest that we, uh, we know we're going to have to consolidate our cafeteria food service programs. Um, we, of course, won't have a new cafeteria when we start school next year. Uh, but, you know, it would be nice if we had it before the end of the school year, but this is one of those things that we get an updated timeline. On the other hand, we're going to start analyzing uh, our needs against opening up that cafeteria, and we know we will be making some um, changes. So uh, as we look for some cuts, that's one I would suggest to you that we may, maybe it's premature, but at the same time, I think we really have to we have to cut the bullet, bite the bullet, and uh, make some changes here. Uh, again, employee benefits, um, nothing particularly remarkable there. Bond issues, you notice we have retired one, uh, but we have others. We're going to have a lot more, of course. And this district-wide thing, we neither Scott nor I knows it knew exactly why that was there. It seemed to be odds and ends, dribbles, and we've zeroed it out. Yeah, there, was only, it in other places. there was only $890 expended out of that to date, so. Yeah, we think it was some historical remnant and we've sent it to Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, the... Um, Can I just, probably you can't answer this and probably be the town manager, but on the school bond, how does the town handle that unknown figure for next year? What, you mean our, our uh, debt School service bond, project? Yeah. Not knowing well, up front. I think that uh, my, my conversation with the town manager on that one is that he would like to, to kind of put a bigger piece this year in a smaller piece next year. Um, he's talking somewhere around 700,000 and he's tentatively putting together some figures that will reflect that. Obviously, what we're working on here is a operating budget, minus that, okay. uh, so that... Uh, I know they make up the difference with the tax base, but I just wonder how do well, you know? Well, of course, we, we still don't know until what Until you go the, out to bond. Yeah, we don't. There are two things that are unknown here. Number one is the rate at which we are going to be able to sell our bonds, and number two, the actual cost of the project. But um, as we've worked our way through the building project, I know you know, you've been on the project listening to the discussions. We are tight. It's certainly not a flush budget for the stuff that has to go on. Uh, so, I mean, we know we're going to be spending close to, if not all, of the 11.7. And um, 
it, the question will be how much of the various alternates that we'll buy. And that's a bid issue. Then we have, of course, we're, naturally we're hoping that the interest on the bonds will come in less than what was projected. But those are the, anyway, that's what my, I'm sure will be updated by the town manager. We did, we're still carrying that contingency. Uh, it is extremely helpful to us to have it, and we are more and more sure that the figures we're putting in here are accurate so that we really don't have any um, areas to absorb unforeseen problems, which always happen. So you, we'd like to continue carrying Do you have any that. idea what we've used so far this year? Scott. Yeah, we've expended about 30000 of the contingency thus far this year. Mm -hmm. Probably more like thirty-five. Yeah, I think that would be my okay. sense, too. Okay, that's sort of the, yes. I won't be here next year, but if I may offer a suggestion. Um, I made a comment to Wayne when he presented at the end of the high school about the special ed. Mm -hmm. And I really do think in terms of the special ed as a district-wide. System-wide, yeah. I did. We've had some conversation about that. And I think it, it would um, change the perspective. Um, I think on the bottom lines of some of the schools, um, if we saw, I mean, it's 12% of our budget overall. Mm -hmm. And if we saw it and we saw the columns side by side, the flipping from 8,800 to 8,900 to find out, you know, when a kid mm -hmm. went from one building to the other. It, it, mm -hmm. I'd just like to offer that suggestion. Sure. Very well. And um, unless there's any questions. Any questions? I have one more comment. I, I'd just like to commend the reduction in um, student transportation costs in line uh, 4130. I know that we've done that. This is now the third year in a row. And I just think that it needs to be noted that there's continuous improvement in scheduling. And um, I just think it should be noted. How are we doing so, Thank you, sir. <laughs> I was just wondering how we were doing in maintenance and overtime and contracted services. Well, actually, the maintenance issue has calmed down a little bit. We had um, Dan spent some money this summer on boilers and then again in the fall. I mean, we just had a last spring at this time, I think mechanical services was camped on our doorstep. Um, somehow, he's been able to get a handle on things, and it's better. Uh, we still have, of course, antiquated systems, and we're far from out of the woods. I mean, it don't get the idea we're not supposed to replace them, they're not going to last. But they're working better. <clears throat> what about custodial? Overtime, we don't have, well, we have, we have very little overtime. I mean, it's yeah. what we, of course, we have custodians who work uh, for community services projects or one thing or another, or building school projects who come in. But uh, what we are really getting is a reliable system. And we can assign people in the overtime Accounts are pretty minimal. And that's, you know, because we, we made that switch last year with the transportation assigning people to the afternoon and evening runs, which cuts down on, you know, the bad news is it for the drivers anyway, they lose some rotation time. But the good news is they have full, full time employment. Um, so that piece is uh, diminished considerably. Rosemary? I just realized I wouldn't be here next year. No. Uh -oh. no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I just think it's very important um, when we take a look at uh, the reductions in a lot of the salary lines and a lot of the changes that have been going on that the work that Connie has done and uh, Scott Poulin to really present accurate figures. I, I mean, I, I cannot tell you how happy I am to, to be able to look at a number and know that you know, maybe plus or minus a dollar or two, but not, you know, $100,000 off. And I just want to thank you very much for that. You will. He's thank worked you. very hard at that. I want you to know that. Good point. Okay. I'm done. Entertain a motion to go into an executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations. So moved. 
Second. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor?